An ancient stone tablet is discovered, and decoding its secrets could rock a core belief of Christianity. It seems to tell the story of a messiah who is killed and rises from the dead after three days. Sound familiar? But this messiah may not be Jesus. This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovic. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. This is a photograph of a unique and mysterious 2,000-year-old tablet or stone. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Christians come to celebrate and commemorate the resurrection of Jesus three days after the crucifixion. This may shake up that. The stone emerged from the antiquities market, and incredibly, the ancient Hebrew text can still, for the most part, be easily read. The key line is this, I, Gabriel, command you, the prince of princes, in three days, live. Now, that may sound strange to the modern ear, but when I first heard about it, I almost fell off my chair. I mean, we're talking about a three-day resurrection. If it's referring to Jesus, this bit of archaeology is the earliest archaeological artifact that refers to him. If it predates Jesus, then who is this Christ-like figure that we didn't know about before? Who is this Jesus before Jesus? To decode the stone, we have to figure out when was it written? Where did it come from? And first, who is this Gabriel mentioned on the stone? In both the Hebrew and Christian Bibles, Gabriel is an angel whose main job is to announce the Messiah. In the Gospels, he's the angel who announces to the Virgin Mary that she will give birth to Jesus. On the stone, Gabriel is not speaking to a woman, Rather, he is talking to a prince of princes, code word in Jesus' time for a Messiah. So the inscription seems to speak of a Messiah who dies and is ordered by the angel Gabriel to rise again after three days. Until now, this has been associated only with Jesus. But renowned biblical scholar Israel Canole, who brought the stone to light, believes that the stone predates Jesus here we have, for the first time, an evidence to the belief in the death and resurrection after three days of a messianic leader existed even before the time of Jesus. I can already hear some of the objections. What are you saying here, that Jesus was a copycat? And I must say, that's a totally unhistorical way of approaching the issue. If you think that Jesus was influenced by no one and he knew exactly where he was going and he landed like an alien from outer space, there's no point looking at any archaeology. But if you put Jesus in his historical context, first century Judea, he was, after all, a first century Jew, then you suddenly have to say, wait a minute, here's a man living in a country under Roman occupation. Clearly he's going to be influenced by people and he's going to influence people. When it comes to this stone, now known as the Gabriel inscription, Canole's theory is that Jesus was influenced by someone, since the stone predates Jesus. But does it? The answer depends on whether the inscription was written before the crucifixion. And to find out, Simca comes to the ancient city of Jaffa in Israel to meet with Robert Deutsch. Deutsch is an epigrapher, a specialist in ancient inscriptions. He's also one of Israel's foremost licensed dealers in antiquities. So he should be able to explain how artifacts like the Gabriel Stone are dated. It has here a poster of the inscription. Deutsch is using a full-size paper copy of the stone, prepared by the academics who studied it. The Gabriel inscription is a very important inscription. The text is important. And the development of the shape of the letter dates the piece. What do you mean that you can date it from the shape of the letter? It develops like a car. The shape of a car, it was never 
the same before, and it will never be the same after that. So you, if you find a car, you can say what year it exactly. was. Exactly. This is typology, which is a very, very accurate tool. To illustrate the point, in the first century BC and early first century AD, the Hebrew letter Lamed, L in English, had a long neck and then lost it. During the same period, the kuf or k lost its little cap. And the mem, the letter M, initially square, became rounded, losing its squiggles in the process. Using these techniques, Deutsch agrees with Professor Canol, dating the Gabriel inscription to a time just before Jesus' crucifixion, possibly before his birth. And it dates to the first century BC and the beginning of the first century AD. So, the inscription seems to predate Jesus, but not by much. To hone in on a more precise date, Simca needs access to the inscription. But the problem is that the stone belongs to an Israeli collector, David Jesselson, who lives in Switzerland. Hi, Dr. Jesselson, it's Simcha. And he won't give Simca access to the artifact. Do you think I can say anything or do anything to convince you to let us just take a little look? Simka isn't surprised. He believes that David Jesselson is like many collectors who don't like investigative journalists around artifacts they've purchased from sometimes shady antiquities dealers. Well, okay, if you change your mind, uh, I think you have my email and... Simka is determined to see the stone. But since he can't get access to the real one, he's commissioning artist Dana Bendov to make him a replica using photographs published in scholarly journals. Since we don't have access to the stone itself, mm -hmm. this is a real one-to-one -one copy. Okay, so this I'm... stone, it's three feet high and one foot wide. Okay. And it's very, very, very unusual. It's got columns. It's got an incision. The letters are hanging from the lines. Mm -hmm. It's not inscribed, which is unusual for a stone. It's painted. Okay, with ink. With Where's ink. With... So what I'd like you to do, because that's what you do for a living, mm -hmm. is make me... Make me this. <laughs> make me this, exactly. <laughs> Building replicas is a highly specialized discipline, and the work begins right away. From the original photograph, the team of reproduction experts are using 3D computer and laser technology to recreate the multiple layers of the stone. From the painstaking carving process to laying on the letters precisely as they appear on the original stone, making the reproduction as close to a perfect copy as possible. This should help Simca figure out its date, origin, and meaning. Though some have questioned Canole's reading, no archaeologists have challenged him. Simca now shows the reproduction to Professor Canole, who has moved beyond deciphering the text to decoding its earth-shattering message. In 2007, an ancient stone came to the attention of scholars that has the potential of shaking Christianity to its foundations. Dubbed the Gabriel Revelation, the text painted on the stone refers to a Messiah that lives, dies, and is resurrected after three days. The writing style, however, seems to suggest the time before Jesus. If the inscription is not referring to Jesus, who is it referring to? Who is this mysterious dying and resurrecting Messiah, and is he the original inspiration for Jesus and his followers? When the stone's existence was first made public, a few scholars, including Israel Kanol, were allowed to study it. Immediately, they recognized it as a genuine artifact. But since the stone is now out of circulation, Simca has brought a replica he commissioned to show Kanol. Does it look like the original? Mm, very much, very much. And look at this, look at the lines. Yeah, the lines, it did them very nice, yes. 
Where are the key words? Uh, uh, I just want to make sure. Here is Le uh, Shloshet Yamin. In three days. Reading the Hebrew text, Professor Canole begins to decode it. For Canole, the key historical clue is a reference to three shepherds. I have sent my people, my three shepherds. Three shepherds. Canole thinks one of these shepherds living around Jesus' birth is the Messiah mentioned on the stone. Their story begins at the end of the first century BC with Herod the Great. Herod was appointed by the Roman Emperor Augustus to rule Judea and do Rome's bidding. He was a tyrant, hated by his subjects. Paranoid that a Christ-like figure would dethrone him, Herod is remembered in the Gospels as the ruler who killed innocent babies, fearing that one of them might be a Messiah. When Herod died in 4 BC, his death triggered a messianic fever. Rebellion broke out on three fronts across the country. This was the beginning. This is the place where the serious rebellion started here, at this point where we, where we sit here now. Was this a nationwide revolt? Yes. Israel was literally burning uh, during this rebellion, yes. There were three centers for this rebellion, three messianic leaders, one Judah in the Galilee, the second one Atrongus in Amos, and the third one Simon from the Perea, from the area of Transjordan. Suddenly, our idea of the world that Jesus was born into seems very different from anything that we heard about in Christmas carols. I mean, this was no tranquil land with shepherds tending their flock and wise men following stars. This was a land riddled by political unrest and violence, rape, pillage, crucifixions, Jews against Romans. There was a revolution going on. And there were not one, but three revolutionary leaders or messianic shepherds one of them seems to have inspired Jesus. But which one? Could it have been a Trogus from a mouse, which is just outside of Jerusalem? Despite more than a century of digging here in Jerusalem, not a single Gabriel-like stone, not one, has ever been found. I mean, ink, painted on stone, anything that resembles it. Now that's very significant because archaeologically speaking, if you have a tradition of memorializing people on stone, then you find more than one. So the fact that not a single one has been found in this area pretty much eliminates a trongus as the dying and resurrecting Messiah mentioned on the stone. Well, that eliminates him. The next candidate is Judah. He operated in the Galilee close to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth and there is one archaeological site associated with him, a place called Gamla. Gamla was a center of revolt before and after Jesus. 37 years after the crucifixion, it was utterly destroyed by the Romans, never to be resettled. Simca is here with archaeologist Danny Sion to see if there is any Gabriel-like stone dating to the pre-Jesus Judah revolt. Immediately inside the gate, they come across signs of the final destruction. Essentially, you guys were the first to come in here since the destruction some 2,000 years ago. That is correct. The general of the Roman armies came here uh, leading three legions. Three full legions is no less than uh, 30,000 people. And then they brought up the siege machines and battering rams, and they used artillery barrage to bombard the city with ballista balls. Here's an example of one such ballista ball. This guy weighs about five kilos. These things are coming raining down on your head. Exactly, exactly. How many have you found of these? 2,000. 2,000? 2, 2, yes. In addition to the ballistas, they used arrows. We found at Gamla 1,600 arrowheads, which is probably more than all the arrowhead finds in all of Europe put together. But Simca is interested in earlier artifacts. Is there anything here related to the would-be Messiah called Judah of Galilee? As it turns out, in the period between Judah's revolt and the final destruction of Gamla in 67 AD, the people came back and rebuilt their city, except for one area, which they left untouched. 
Simka and Danny head there now, looking for signs of the messianic leader called Judah. So what exactly are we looking at here? Sometime round about the death of King Herod, this area was completely and totally abandoned. So let me get this straight. This was a living, breathing place. And then suddenly, you know, like a volcanic eruption, it comes to a grinding halt. That is correct. But the bigger enigma is why nobody came back afterwards, because life went on around this area. People were living right around. Right around. Could it be that this place that we're standing is actually, a, a, in a sense, a monument to the revolt at the time of Judah. The timing is right with the death of Herod. And the reason that people lived around it but didn't enter it is because so many people died here, they didn't want to go into what, in essence, was a graveyard. That, that is certainly acceptable, acceptable proposition. Simka's convinced that Judah, the messianic leader who led the revolution, left such an impression on the people of Galilee that sections of their towns were left as permanent memorials. But no Gabriel-like inscriptions have been found in Gamla. So this leaves Simca only one candidate for the Messiah before Jesus, Simon of Perea. Perea is located on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea. It is here that the most famous writings ever found were unearthed. They are called the Dead Sea Scrolls and are housed in a special museum in Jerusalem. Discovered in 1948, the more than 2,000-year-old documents are the oldest biblical texts ever found. When scholars first studied the Gabriel inscription, they were struck by the fact that it looked like a Dead Sea Scroll on a stone. The similarities between the scrolls and the Gabriel inscription are impressive. Both are written in ink. On both, the text is written in two columns, and both have the Hebrew letters suspended from the upper guidelines. All this suggests that the stone, like the scrolls, originates from the shores of the Dead Sea. So in search of a Gabriel-like stone in the area of Perea, Simca travels here to meet with archeologist Constantinos Politis, who's been digging in this area for 20 years. Well, this is our dig house for the last 20 years, so we've got all our goodies in here, too. I'm, I'm excited about seeing the goodies. Please, after you. <laughs> wow, talk about goodies. Oh, my God. Well, I don't think mus museums have this much. Oh. Well, all this is going to go into the museum, but for the moment, it's in our storage. Pottery, mosaics, human bodies in the background. Are you serious? Yeah, there's about 50 bodies back there. 50? Maybe more. Yeah, this is really neat. Among the artifacts unearthed by Politis, Simca is struck by ancient Jewish and Christian gravestones, reminiscent of the Gabriel inscription. But these don't have writings. However, Politis has a lot more artifacts in his overflowing archaeological workplace. Well, there's a number of tombstones here. We're running out of space, so we just put them in this bathroom. But um, like these, for instance, so what is that? It's a marker above of the burial. Simca now understands that Gabriel-like stones can be grave markers. But everything Politis has shown him is inscribed, not painted, and written in Greek. The Gabriel inscription is written in Hebrew. Well, let's see what we've got under here. We've been here for a while, but... Yeah. <laughs> Look at that, my goodness. I have dust bunnies under my bed. We can pull out some of them. Uh, see. Rough on the back. Yeah, it's a bit, ah, here you go. That's a, that's a Jewish one. Whoa. Very simple, uh, no. It's faded, no. but uh, this one is Hebrew. Politis now shows Simca several Gabriel-like Hebrew stones. It's a tradition of writing in paint directly on a stone without engraving, and it seems to be more common amongst the Jewish ones. We're here for a reason, and I think the Gabriel inscription seems to come um, from this area. We know that in the Dead Sea area, there is this uh, tradition of writing, uh, painting letters on, on stone. It's not unlikely that the Gabriel inscription could also be coming from this area, as opposed to other eastern desert areas. 
By tracing the stone to Perea, the investigation seems to have linked the dying and resurrecting Messiah with Simon of Perea, the man who may have inspired Jesus. Only a few kilometers from where Politus has found his Gabriel-like stones is the exact area where Simon began his revolution. We're in an area called, in the land called Perea, which means in Greek, beyond, beyond the river, the Jordan River. How does this relate to Simon of Perea? This well, this is the land that he was in, and behind us we have this town of Macheras, which is where he was living. A Roman, Byzantine, early Christian town, very similar to some of the buildings that have been built here. Same stones that have been reused here, same type of architecture, more or less. So basically, when we talk about Simon of Perea, he might have lived in this village, and he might have lived in a house that looked not much different than this. Oh, yes, very much so. When Simon started his campaign, he seized this area first. It's a, it's a natural strategic point. So if you start a revolution, this is a good place to start it. It's defended naturally, and you have a very good viewpoint right across the Dead Sea to Judea, so yes. You read in Josephus that uh, Simon of Pereira led a revolt, that it was crushed. It's one thing. But when you actually see, you know, troughs, mills, houses, you know, when you connect with the everyday life of human existence, to think of how it looked like or felt like when people were killed and sold into slavery and raped and crucified, there's an emotional connection for me. The evidence is mounting that Simon is the Messiah memorialized on the stone and the man who may have inspired Jesus. But if the Gabriel stone did come from Perea, how did it get to the West? Simca now goes inside an illegal Jordanian antiquities market to find out. In 2007, Professor Israel Knoll drew the attention of scholars from around the world to a remarkable inscription painted on stone that refers to a Messiah that dies and is resurrected. The writing style seems to suggest a time before Jesus. The stone also talks about three shepherds, possibly three revolutionary leaders that instigate a revolution around the time of Jesus' birth. The archaeological trail has led us to one of them, Simon of Perea, modern-day Jordan. He was a would-be Messiah that died around 37 years before Jesus' crucifixion. But before we conclude that it is Simon and that he is indeed the model for Jesus, we have to make sure that we understand how a stone that originated in Perea, Jordan, made its way into the modern Western antiquities market. If he can trace the Gabriel inscription back to the antiquities market in Perea, Simca will be closer to linking the Messiah celebrated on the stone to the revolutionary leader called Simon of Perea. Here we are, we're surrounded by literally hundreds of thousands of robbed up tombs. And if you look at the entire area, the whole hill above us. All those dimples, all those holes in the side of the hill? Those are robbed out tombs. Looters tombs. They come at night and they're digging quickly, but it, that, that hole could have several tombs underneath there. And it's basically people who live around here. The people are living on top of the cemeteries of that period, underneath the houses. When they dig the foundations, they found these things. And then when they sell one or two, they see they make some money. They maybe just walk a, a few hundred yards right here, dig it up and sell some more. Exactly. They get, what, a hundred bucks? They get whatever they can get. They might get $10 or they might get a thousand, but usually we're talking about small amounts compared to what the middleman are getting. Because the middleman is the one who sells it to some, gets out of the country, so. He gets out of the country illegally. He connects with the art markets in London and Switzerland and New York, and, and then he, the price goes up astronomically. How does the market work? If the Gabriel Stone was dug up in Jordan, how exactly did it end up in the living room of a collector? For an antiquity to be legally sold, it needs to have been dug up by an archeologist and its authenticity needs to be verified. As Simca has discovered, 
there is a vast underground commerce in illegal antiquities. Looters outnumber archaeologists and regularly dig up ancient artifacts, then sell them to dealers on the black market. How are you? You speak English? Our team now hooks up with one of those dealers. Transactions like this one take place in secret locations, as no one wants to be identified with this kind of illegal business. How much for this? 10,000. After buying artifacts from looters, dealers then sell their wares to collectors and tourists. But the whole thing is illegal. Uh, 15,000 GDs. 21,000 US. This works for small souvenirs. But what about more significant artifacts like the Gabriel Stone, which fetch a substantial price on the illegal market? To find out how the stone might have been smuggled out of Jordan, Simka heads back to Israel to see Shlomo Musayev, the world's leading collector of biblical antiquities. Hi, Shlomo. How are you? Good. How are nice you? to see you. Musayev's personal collection rivals some of the most notable museums in the world. These cases hold just a fraction of the thousands of pieces he has purchased. Simka is astonished to discover that Musayev's collection also includes stones like the one Politis showed him in Jordan, the kind that bear a striking resemblance to the Gabriel inscription. Oh, oh this is beautiful. Yeah. They're painted. Yeah. Yes. You know what's amazing, though? They look to be all about the same thickness, and they're rough on the back. Yes, this is the, the Gabriel is also rough on the back. And it's smoothed down on the front. Yes, this is exactly as the Gabriel one. Musayev's stones come from Perea, once again suggesting that painted Aramaic and Hebrew inscriptions are unique to the region. He bought them from a now deceased dealer named Rahani. But how do dealers get large looted pieces out of Jordan and into buyers' hands? Rahani, I know, 45 years. Let, let me get this straight. A piece like this, right? Some guy digs it out of the ground, he gets it, he paid off people on the airline, yes? Yeah. And that's how it got to London. Yeah. And then he comes straight to you. Yeah. Since Rahani was the address for high-end archaeology that originated in Perea, and Musayev knew Rahani for 45 years, Simka decides to take a chance. OK, so what I want to know is this. Did you ever encounter a... Uh, piece much bigger, three feet high, the one that was recently published. I saw it, it is in Zurich. Uh, Rihani showed it to you? Sure he showed me. Why didn't you buy because it? Because he asked me such a big price. How much did he ask for it? $200,000. $200, $200,000. But what would you have been prepared to pay at that time? Hundred, hundred fifty. You would have paid 100, 150,000? Yeah. No more. Simka's now unraveled many of the stone's secrets. The writing style, the archaeology, and the way the stone appeared on the antiquities market all point to Perea as its place of origin. Simka has also discovered that a rebel named Simon came from this area and that his followers thought he was a messiah. Israel Canole believes that he has found strong textual evidence suggesting that Simon's followers were the first to claim that their leader rose from the dead. The argument centers on a word mentioned on the stone that is meaningless to anyone except a biblical scholar. The word is domen, which means dung. But Canole points out that every biblical reference to domen means one thing only, rotting flesh. Prince of princes, and he decomposed in a gorge because those who have killed him did not let his body to be buried. Around the time of Jesus, the story on the stone seems to fit Simon and no one else. Simon's story goes like this. At first, Simon was successful. He defeated a Roman garrison and crowned himself Messiah. The Romans went after him with a vengeance, and they chased Simon into a Perean gully like this one. 
After a bloody battle, they decapitated him. To further demoralize his followers, they didn't allow them to bury his body. This is the very story Canole believes he has decoded on the stone. But really, this makes sense. I can just see a battle, right? They can come in here. A few people can, can hold off a lot of people, but they can get surrounded. So the leader wants to get a little bit of a better position, right? He runs up. He runs up a place like this. He's chased. He's literally met. He's surrounded from that side. He's decapitated. You know, he, 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 he falls. He dies in a place like this, you know? And then, you know, there's bodies all over the place. And then it's easy to guard so that the followers can't come to even bury their dead. Lying down here, decomposing. This body is turned into dung. Domen. This word is used several times in the Bible, where somebody is not allowed to be buried. His body is stays outside and rats, like these animals that we, we see here. But if Canole is right, and Simon is the man memorialized on the stone, why would his followers continue to call him a messiah after his violent death? After all, a messiah was supposed to defeat his enemies, not be defeated by them. It is at this point that Canole's detective work becomes most controversial. We've been investigating an ancient Hebrew inscription written around the time of Jesus' birth that tells the story of a Christ-like figure who comes back to life three days after he's killed. Our sleuthing has led us to a man called Simon of Perea. Simon's followers believed he was the long-prophesied savior sent to free them from Roman rule. Every text in the Hebrew Bible that talks about this king is coming, he does two things. He executes justice and righteousness in the land, and then he goes and conquers basically the entire world and brings it all under the rule of God. I mean, this is the Messiah. This is his, like his resume, his job description. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that the reason Herod fortified these desert places is he feared more than anything that a native king might rise in Perea, in Judea, in Galilee, and have some sort of claim to the throne. Now, this is very interesting. What, what could some peasant, like a Jesus figure, even before Jesus, we've got a number of people that come along. They don't have an army. They don't have power. They don't have uh, the wealth or the influence of Herod. He could order uh, a 1,000 troops at any moment to do anything. What they have is this pedigree. If anybody is a descendant of King David and begins to get the religious call to say, I think I'm the one, there's the potential for hundreds of thousands of Jews to flock to this person and make him king. Thousands of people did flock to Simon's side. He was crowned king and declared Messiah, Redeemer. In Greek, he was called Christ. At first, Simon seemed to be a God-chosen winner. He led his followers to victory. But then, the Roman army defeated him, decapitated him, and left him to rot in the desert. At that point, according to Canole, Simon's followers did something revolutionary. Even after death, they continued to call him Christ. So actually, out of the gravest crisis, a new idea comes. An idea that see the suffering and the dying of the Messiah as an essential part of the process of salvation. It changed history. Yes, of course. In the next generation, this ideology will be picked up by Jesus. It will be a leading ideology for his messianic activity. And later on, the Roman emperor was defeated by this ideology. So it seems that Simon's followers turned this defeat into victory. The death of their Messiah, they said, did not disqualify him. In fact, his suffering proved that he was the Christ. According to Canole, 
This theological spin was made possible by arguing that all along, Scripture predicted not one, but two messiahs, a winner from the line of David and a suffering servant from the line of Joseph. If Canol is right, the Gabriel inscription, which is at least 400 years older than the earliest New Testament text, is the earliest document ever found mentioning a suffering savior. Now we have the perfect... The, the smoking gun. The smoking gun. The Messiah, son of David, and the Messiah, son of Joseph are appearing in the same line in this document. Two messiahs. Two messiahs. The triumphal messiah and the suffering messiah are both here. And it's the earliest reference? This is the earliest reference to a messiah, son of Joseph. The suffering, dying, and rising messiah. Pretty revolutionary. We've got a text now that shows us this notion of a suffering Messiah who's raised from the dead is already being developed within Judaism. So it's not something Jesus came up with. It's not something the disciples came up with. It's something that is beginning to develop out of the hard experience of the Jewish people, which is everyone we put our hope in is killed. Why is this happening to us? But if Simon was the original model for Jesus, this still leaves one important mystery to be solved. How could Jesus have been influenced by Simon? After all, one died in what is now Jordan, and the other lived a month-long journey away in the Galilee. It seems that the Gabriel inscription has been decoded it was probably a gravestone that marked the place where Simon of Perea was cut down by his Roman enemies. A reference to three shepherds or messianic figures led Simca to three revolutionary leaders that died at the time of Jesus' birth. A reference to one of them decomposing in a gully implies that the would-be Messiah was Simon of Perea. A further reference to the angel Gabriel suggests that Simon's followers believed that he was resurrected three days after his death. Finally, a reference to a suffering servant seems to be the first text ever found describing the long-awaited Messiah not as a winner, but as a loser. All these clues taken together point to Simon of Perea as the original model for Jesus of Nazareth. We have a new insight with this Gabriel text. It kind of nudges us toward the idea that Jesus, before he dies, is already anticipating, not because God told him in a miracle or because he's the son of God and therefore he knew everything, but he's struggling, wondering, where do I fit in? What is my role? What do the prophecies say about someone like me? and he begins to talk in these riddles that's throwing everybody off. And he takes his inner group aside. They have a talk about, is he the one? And he basically admits, yes, you've got it. I, I am the one. They're thinking, oh, then we're going to march down to Jerusalem, take over, armies of angels will command, and it'll all be over. And he says, no, no, no. I'm going to be spit upon and beaten and persecuted and killed. And then here's the key. And after three days, I'll live. Now, where is that coming from? I think it's probably unlikely that he took a little trip to Perea and read our actual stone and thought, oh, that, you know, I'll be like Simon. But what the text tells us is these ideas are in the air. They're being discussed. Where? Out in the wilderness, out by the Dead Sea, out in the place where messiahs come. But how would Jesus, who lived in northern Israel, have been influenced by Simon, who lived in Perea, modern-day Jordan? I mean, the two are 130 miles apart, a month-long journey in Jesus' time. Well, it turns out 
that in precisely the same location where Simon lived and died, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, lived and was beheaded. In order to fill in the last piece of the puzzle, Simca travels with Israel Kanol to Machaerus and Perea, where John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas. Like Simon and Jesus, John the Baptist was preaching a religious revival that set him on a collision course with the Roman authorities. And it is here, in this stronghold, that John the Baptist lost his life. If we are asking ourselves, how is it possible that uh, Jesus got this ideology? Who was the link? How was the connection made? Between Simon of Perea? Between Simon of Perea and Jesus, because when Simon was killed, Jesus was probably one year old, two years old. He couldn't talk to him, of course. So the ideal solution would be either John the Baptist himself or, or other people around him. John the Baptist had a large following. Many thought that John was the long-awaited Messiah, but John seems to have deferred to Jesus. He even baptized him. Canole believes that John, who spent time in Perea, must have known Simon and believed in him. Perhaps after Simon's death, the Baptist brought Jesus into the fold. When Jesus came to John, he could listen and hear this ideology and be influenced by it. So really what we're talking about is that this world-changing idea of a suffering Messiah, a suffering, dying, and rising Messiah was born here. And that the link between this idea that grew up around Simon of Perea and Jesus may have been Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, who was beheaded right here. Yes. You gotta ask, what shepherd or messiah was left to rot and die in the crevice of a rock around the time of the death of Herod? I mean, it's rare that we can do this. We can pretty well say, I think, this is this Shimon, Simon. And Professor Israel Knoll has solved a mystery, I think. At this moment of 4 BCE, the Romans thought, okay, we crushed this rebellion. We killed the messianic leaders. Simon is dead in Transjordan in a narrow valley there. At the end, but this will take time, Roman will be conquered by this belief, by the followers of this belief. So the Jewish Messiah wins out. The Jewish Messiah transforming to the Christian Messiah will defeat the Roman Empire. Some 2,000 years ago, Simon's followers came up with a revolutionary, world-altering idea. Namely, that a defeated Messiah is not a false Messiah. They argued that the defeat, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of the Messiah is an essential part of redemption. This idea that grew up around Simon in a desert like this is still celebrated in every church where Jesus is worshipped. It was the archaeological find of a lifetime, the tomb of Caiaphas, the high priest of the Jewish people, who the Gospels state sent Jesus to the Romans to be crucified. Two nails were found in the tomb. Could they be the nails that crucified Jesus? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. In 1990, here in Jerusalem, just a few meters down this hill, workers building a park, now called the Peace Park, made the most amazing archaeological discovery. They found a 2,000-year-old burial tomb. But it wasn't just the burial tomb of anybody. It was the burial tomb of someone mentioned in the Gospels, the high priest Caiaphas. 
And he's the man that, according to the Gospels, is partially responsible for sending Jesus to the cross. For nearly 2,000 years, Caiaphas's tomb was left undisturbed. Then, in 1990, construction workers stumbled upon a rather large burial site. The Israeli Antiquities Authority, or IAA, sent out archaeologists to excavate the site. What they found was a first century Jewish tomb. Inside, there were four kohims, or burial niches, and inside these, there were 12 ossuaries or bone boxes. These limestone coffins where the bones of the dead are laid included the ossuary which bears the inscription, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. That story made headlines, but here's a story that didn't make headlines. Nobody reports that, in fact, nobody knows if that tomb still exists. Archaeologists don't know if it was destroyed when the park was built, nobody cares. And here's something else that no media, no media whatsoever reported. Inside that tomb, they found two Roman nails. Wait a minute, they found two nails in the tomb of the man who sent Jesus to the cross and nobody reports it? Why? And what's more, where are they? The first stop in any investigation involving an Israeli archaeological site is the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. It is headquarters for the Israeli Antiquities Authority. These archives house the original reports of every archaeological excavation supervised by the IAA. Simca locates the 1990 Caiaphas tomb archaeological file. In it, he discovers the original drawing of the tomb he also finds the final, unedited report. And this includes detailed drawings, measurements, and photographs. And although the two Roman nails are mentioned, there are no photographs, measurements, drawings, or any information as to their current whereabouts. The main find is the now famous ossuary inscribed with the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas. The Christian Gospels simply call him Caiaphas. The first century historian Josephus mentions a high priest called Joseph Caiaphas. What's written on the ossuary, however, is Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Believing Josephus is closer to the truth, scholars generally agree that despite the different versions, this is the bone box of the man who sent Jesus to the cross. To understand why Caiaphas would do such a thing, we have to understand the specific historical context in which the confrontation between Jesus and Caiaphas took place. The date was 30 AD, and Judea was under Roman occupation. Even the Jewish religious elite had to answer directly to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The Roman authorities had appointed Caiaphas to the high priesthood, the most prestigious and powerful position a Jew could hold. According to the Gospels, on the Jewish holiday of Passover, Jerusalem was bursting with religious fervor. And supported by a large gathering of followers, Jesus came to the temple, the holiest site in all of Judaism. He drove the cattle herders and dove sellers out, overturned the tables of the money changers. Then he warned the Romans, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Talking to the Roman authorities in this way was tantamount to a call for revolt. There was a near riot, and Caiaphas, to keep order, has Jesus arrested and put on trial. Jesus is hastily convicted of inciting opposition to the Romans and turned over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The Gospels state that Pilate sends Jesus to the cross and famously washes his hands of the deed. Caiaphas is left to bear the burden. We don't know whether he was or wasn't troubled by the outcome of his decision. 
This Ashuri, which uh, has an archaeological connection with the Gospels, was excavated in the uh, 1990s from uh, the promenade in the southern part of Jerusalem. There is an inscription, you can see it on the side of the Ashuri. It mentions Caiaphas. Caiaphas, who was the high priest in the time of Jesus, and Jesus is mentioned to be judged by Caiaphas. The ossuary has been sent around the world, and millions of onlookers have had a chance to view it in person, witnessing up close what scholars believe to be the first ever discovery of a man who came in contact with Jesus. But is it really the ossuary of the man who sent Jesus to the cross? To answer that question, Simca meets with David Mevera, a curator at the Israel Museum. Here's my question. How are you so convinced that this is the Caiaphas? It is a rare name. It's a name that we know from both Jewish sources and from the New Testament. And it is good in dating and timing for that period. And the most elaborate ossuary, very luckily for us, had twice an inscription on it naming Joseph son of Caiaphas, the one that we know from the New Testament. So it's definitely the tomb, as all tombs were, of a clan. It's a priestly clan. So the Caiaphas clan were buried in that tomb. Scholars generally agree with Dr. Mevra. Caiaphas is a rare name, and the ossuary is very ornate, befitting a high priest. But what happened to the nails found inside the tomb? A starting point would be to find the location of the tomb itself. In search of the nails of the crucifixion, Simka is on his way to the Peace Park to look for the tomb. He has two clues. First, according to the archaeological report, there should be a playground nearby. But even if he finds the playground, how does he identify the tomb if it's been covered up? The second clue is provided by Jewish religious law. According to this law, before sealing a tomb, the archaeologist must insert a nephesh or pipe for the free flow of spirits that once inhabited the tomb. The nephesh is somewhere in this park, but where? OK, guys, this is it. At least I hope it's it. There's supposed to be some kind of children's park or something nearby and we're looking for a green pipe sticking out of the ground. Each one of us grab one of these terraces and let's find a tomb. Even if they are in the right place, what are the odds that the pipe is still accessible and not overgrown with bushes? But if the pipe and the playground can be found together, then the Caiaphas tomb would be rediscovered. Look, here's the playground. Hey, guys, found the pipe. Looks like this is our pipe. Just saw another pipe by the playground over there. Looks similar. Another pipe? No, but then there's two tombs, you understand? There's there seems to be two tombs close to one another. One of them is the Caiaphas tomb. Given that his intention is to put a camera down the pipe to look for the missing Roman nails, Simka has to ascertain whether the pipe is clear or obstructed. Something is blocking it. We need a GPR, we need a ground penetrating radar. But the good thing is this is pretty The low. pipes indicate that the Caiaphas tomb was not destroyed in 1990 by the people building this park. In the original report, there is a mention of a second tomb found near the Caiaphas tomb. But the ceiling was collapsed and it was deemed unsafe. Ground penetrating radar should reveal which tomb is the collapsed one and which is the Caiaphas tomb. So Simca has brought in GPR specialists to help determine whether what lies below the pipe may actually be the Caiaphas tomb. First, they go to the tomb that is farthest from the playground. So it may be quite exciting because we may have an excavated and an unexcavated tomb. Basically, what I'm hoping is that you and your work can throw some light on it. Ground penetrating radar can be used to determine whether areas below the surface hold ancient archaeological sites. Go! 
GPR works by bouncing sound waves through rock. Okay, next line. And getting feedback, revealing different densities and open spaces. It looks like there's something there. I have been seeing something around this one and a half meter depth. It has more potential to being a collapsed cave than being an open cave. The radar shows that the first location seems to correspond to the information pertaining to the collapsed tomb, not the Kaifa's tomb. I think that we should pack up and move. Okay. My gut feel? Yeah. We're gonna, this is gonna be, you're gonna have a nice open space here. 4.24 is on your end. Okay. There, we have something here. That's great, that's great, that's great. All right. Okay, we've got a tomb. Hello, Felix? We've located the tomb. Could it be that the nails are still down in the tomb of the man who sent Jesus to the cross? The only tomb ever discovered that scholars generally agree belongs to someone mentioned in the Gospels was found in Jerusalem in 1990. It was the tomb of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, that according to the Gospels, turned Jesus over to the Roman authorities, who then crucified him. Although Caiaphas's ossuary or bone box was put on display, the tomb itself was covered over. More than that, two Roman nails found in the tomb disappeared. They were not sketched, photographed, measured, or archived. Could it be that they were the nails that were used to crucify Jesus? Is it possible that Caiaphas kept them as some kind of morbid souvenir of the most infamous execution in history? Although we know that tens of thousands of people were crucified, the fact is that there exists only one archeological artifact attesting to this gruesome practice. It was found in 1970 here in Jerusalem. The artifact is a crucified heel now being kept in a lab at Tel Aviv University. When it was found, it made international headlines. Scholars went out of their way to say that the crucified heel did not belong to Jesus, but rather to a man called Jonathan, who lived around Jesus' lifetime. The heel has never been exhibited in public due to religious sensibilities. Nonetheless, Professor Hershkovitz agrees to show it to Simka. Yes. This is the original. This is the only evidence we have for crucifixion. In the world? In, in the world. I know it's very popular these days to say that they use some kind of ropes to tie the crucified person to the crossbar, but in a way, this doesn't make sense because you can't do crucifixion without bloodshed. The whole philosophy, it's humiliation and punishment. I myself, I disregard the story of, of ropes, you know, for crucifixion. I think they were using nails. They were using probably short nails for the palm of the hand and longer nails for the heel bone. Classic uh, Jesus painting one going through the hand is more I, accurate. I believe so. According to Professor Hershkovitz, we learn from the crucified heel bone that there were at least four crucifixion nails used, two on the heels on either side of the upright post, and at least one or two on each hand. And we now know from the heel bone that nails had to be at least 12 centimeters long for the heels, but we still don't know how big the hand nails had to be. Now that Simkin knows what a crucifixion nail looks like, he heads back to the Rockefeller Museum. Archaeology is all about context and clusters of artifacts. If Simca is ever going to figure out the mystery of the missing nails from the Caiaphas tomb, and whether they might be the nails of the crucifixion, he has to find out what other artifacts were found with the nails. And here, there is no lack of detailed information. Including the nails, the report lists five items. All of them have to do with the afterlife. The first find mentioned is an oil lamp. Oil lamps were used to commemorate the dead. 
The second artifact is a glass perfume bottle. These expensive bottles were associated with women. Unlike today, each woman had her own perfume mixture. So it is likely that the scent of a woman was associated with her soul. After all, perfume is associated with scent, and scent, in Jewish tradition, is associated with the afterlife. The next item is the most surprising. One would not expect to find it in the tomb of a Jewish high priest. It is a Roman coin found in the skull of a woman buried in the tomb. A coin in the skull is common to pagan burials, not Jewish ones. Coins were placed under the tongue of the deceased so that the soul of the dead could pay the boatman when crossing the mythical river Styx in Hades. After the flesh rotted, the coin fell into the skull. The presence of the coin in the skull shows that this family of Jewish high priests were influenced by Roman burial practices. So the coin was also associated with the afterlife. And then there were the nails. What possible connection could they have with the afterlife? As it turns out, in first century Judaism, only one type of nail was associated with the afterlife, nails used in crucifixion. They were considered to be a powerful talisman, protecting their owner in this life and the next. Taken together, the ossuary, the lamp, the glass bottle, and the coin all tell the same story, an obsession with the afterlife. It seems the only reason that nails would be part of this cluster is that they were used to crucify someone. And since Caiaphas is associated with only one crucifixion, could they be the nails that were driven into Jesus? You're excavating Caiaphas's tomb. You find iron nails. You think, ah, nails. You know, you could say, look, crucifying Jesus was a small event in Caiaphas's life. He's the priest, he has many things to do. Jesus was not important. He's important to us, but to him, he was just one more guy he got rid of. I don't think that's the case. He might not have known the day it happened, this is gonna become the biggest thing in my life. This is gonna haunt me to my grave. But I think by the time he died, that act was major. So if there were crucifixion nails in the Caiaphas tomb, I don't think most of us would say, oh, well, this is just a coincidence. It's a little indication of something much bigger. To see if the nails were left in the Caiaphas tomb, Simca is attempting to lower cameras into the so-called soul pipe. But the soul pipe over the Caiaphas tomb is blocked. Now that the GPR has shown Simca where the Caiaphas tomb is, Simka has to get around the blockage of the pipe, so he calls a pipe expert, namely a plumber. Because there is an elbow at the top of the pipe, Ezra the plumber can't get his equipment down. So he elects to cut a hole in the side of the pipe, just above ground level, which can later be welded shut. It looks like there's just garbage on it. With the obstruction gone, Simca might be able to lower a camera down the soul pipe and into the Caiaphas tomb, hopefully revealing the missing nails. That's good, it looks clear. I see the curve, it looks empty, I didn't expect it. Simca now gathers his team that includes experts at working robotic cameras. After due preparation, they're finally ready to put a camera down the pipe. Bill Tarrant is one of these experts. All right, so go for it. All right, we're going to go for it. His high-resolution camera, once lowered into the tomb, may detect the nails if they're still there. OK, there we go. So hopefully, you'll have beautiful images for me. OK. 
going through one pipe. There's the other part of the pipe. With these clear, high-resolution images from the camera, are Simka and his team on the verge of finding the nails of the crucifixion? Simka is investigating a first-century Jerusalem burial tomb, identified as the last resting place of the high priest Caiaphas, who sent Jesus to the cross. Strangely, two Roman nails found in the cave, possibly associated with crucifixion, have gone missing, and the cave itself has been covered over. Simca has located the tomb and a pipe that leads into it. In the hope of locating the nails, a high-resolution camera has been lowered into the pipe. At first, everything looks good. There's the other part of the pipe. Sitting at the elbow, the camera can now see into the second pipe. I'm zooming in. Unfortunately, spikes used to secure the joints of the pipe prevent the camera from traveling further. Simca now has to call for a smaller, more flexible camera, but it has to come from another town, so everything has been put on hold. Okay, coffee break. Okay. okay. Ignored by the majority of scholars is the fact that there wasn't one, but two ossuaries with the Caiaphas inscription found in the tomb a simple ossuary bearing the name Caiaphas, and an ostentatious ossuary bearing the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas. The first century historian Josephus mentions a high priest, Joseph Caiaphas. This is taken by scholars to be one and the same as the Joseph, son of Caiaphas, buried in the fancy ossuary. So, they have identified this ossuary with the Jewish high priest from the time of Jesus. But the Gospels do not call the high priest who sent Jesus to the cross Joseph Caiaphas or Joseph, son of Caiaphas. They simply called that high priest Caiaphas. Can it be that although the Gospel writers talk about one high priest called Caiaphas, there were actually two, two from the same family? One was indeed ostentatious, but the other one was modest. Can it be we've been focusing on the wrong Caiaphas all along? To find out more about the real Caiaphas of the Jesus story, Simca now travels what would have been a 20-day journey at the time of Jesus to modern-day Turkey and on to a small town called Antioch. Early Jesus followers fled here to escape Roman persecution and it is here that the Christian movement itself was born. Simca meets New Testament scholar Barry Wilson. He's hoping to get a better sense of the historical Caiaphas to determine which ossuary belongs to the high priest who confronted Jesus. Fantastic mountain <laughs> riddled with tunnels. Those holes? These were the escape routes of early Christians when they were fleeing from the Romans. It's a fantastic network within this mountain. This is where they practiced Christianity before it was an official religion, before it was recognized. That's right. They had to remain underground. Uh, they used caves as churches here. This was the earliest Vatican. The Christians who worshipped here had access to texts that were later suppressed by the Western Church. One of these deals with Caiaphas. There's a very interesting document that dates from uh, the 6th century, possibly earlier. It's preserved in an Arabic source. And this is an amazing document because it starts off by saying that this is the book of the high priest, the one called Caiaphas. So it's a book that's allegedly written by the high priest Caiaphas. He's uh, the bad guy. He was the bad guy. He was implicated with Pontius Pilate uh, at the trial of Jesus. But he says in this document about Jesus, this is the one whom we adore. This is the one who for our sakes uh, became incarnate. This is the one who for our sakes redeemed us and who has blessed us with everlasting compassion. This is the high priest, the Jewish high priest, the, one of the two most powerful leaders in Judea of the time, presented as speaking with a Christian voice. This text, representing a little-known Christian tradition, portrays Caiaphas not as a villain, but as a devout follower of Jesus. But if this text is accurate, this means that the Gospels distorted the truth about Caiaphas. Well, you know, Caiaphas's tomb has been found. Yes. Did you know that there were nails? No, I didn't know that. They've disappeared. They've disappeared. 
That's a remarkable absence. Why would it be so remarkable if an Israeli archaeologist said, ah, it's just nails? What would you say to them? Well, I would want to find out what was so significant about these nails that it would be associated with b the burial of uh, Caiaphas. For you, this is an important question. It's an important question. You wouldn't brush it off? No. You wouldn't lose the nails? No. No. The nails are an important clue to something, some link to some other historic person. There's only one crucified person that Caiaphas is linked to. Then, that's linked to Jesus. <laughs> Armed with the knowledge that there is an alternative Christian tradition depicting Caiaphas as a good guy, and knowing that in the Caiaphas tomb a modest ossuary was found, Simca now heads back to Jerusalem to see what more he can learn about the real Caiaphas. Historian Dr. Helen Bond has spent much of her career examining the life of this prominent high priest. In her writings, she argues that the Gospel's portrayal of Caiaphas is historically inaccurate. She now takes Simca to a church, which according to Christian tradition, is built where Caiaphas once lived. Since Caiaphas was also a judge, one would expect to find holding cells under his home. And indeed, that's precisely what archeologists have found here. Jesus could have been held right here, the night he was arrested. The Gospels tend to caricature the high priest. He's shown as jealous of Jesus. He's completely corrupt. The whole trial narrative in Mark's Gospel, for example, is a kangaroo court. It's a terrible picture of a Jewish high priest that comes over. It's a long way from historical accuracy. And the reason for that, I think, is that all of the Gospels are written at the end of the first century, at a time when Christians and Jews are starting to go their separate ways. And so in a way, Caiaphas is sort of a victim of this. He becomes caught up in all of this negativity and portrayed in a very negative way. And I think Caiaphas has suffered because of that. Um, there's nobody particularly interested in rehabilitating him. So what if Caiaphas never meant for Jesus to be crucified, merely arrested? What if, as the alternative Caiaphas tradition suggests, he became a follower rather than a persecutor of Jesus? Perhaps by re-examining the limestone coffins, Simca will be able to determine which Caiaphas is the one who confronted Jesus. We have now located Caiaphas' tomb by identifying a pipe that leads into it. Maybe by re-examining the ossuaries that came from that tomb, we will be able to determine whether Caiaphas is really the bad guy of the Gospels or whether he was a good guy who took two of the crucifixion nails with him to the grave. To analyze and compare the two ossuaries, Simca has come to the Israel Museum where both are currently stored. He's first shown the famous ossuary scholars believe once held the bones of the historic Caiaphas. Remarkably, after 2,000 years, it's in unbelievably good shape. Look at this. I've seen a lot of ossuaries, and this is it's really- the most beautiful I've ever seen. Yeah, it is one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Yeah, it's, look, look how elaborate. Many of the fancier ossuaries are decorated with what scholars call rosettes. Although their exact meaning is not known, many scholars dismiss the design as merely decorative, an ostentatious display of wealth and status. Simca now examines the famous inscription. See, this is what we couldn't see when it was on the shelf. It's so clear. It's Joseph, son of Aramaic, Bar Kaifa. There it is. The evidence seems to support the argument that this ossuary held the bones of the historic Caiaphas. But Simca is now shown the second, more modest Caiaphas ossuary. The amazing thing about this one is that this one actually is more consistent with what it says in the Gospels. Because there it doesn't say Joseph, son of Caiapha, it just says Caiapha. Incredibly, it is this inscription which just states Caiaphas that matches the Gospels. Scholars have ignored it because they prefer first century historian Josephus as a source, and they are dazzled by the fancy ossuary. 
but it is the name inscribed on this simple ossuary that is more consistent with the Gospels. It's beautiful and it's modest. And this one is consistent not with the bad guy Caiaphas, but with the good guy Caiaphas. Mm -hmm. This second Caiaphas ossuary also has rosettes, though clearly less elaborate. Still, they are consistent with the status of a high priest. Intriguingly, there's also an enigmatic symbol between the two rosettes, which has never been decoded. It shows five temple-like steps supporting a pillar with seven cornices, and between the cornices, six arrows pointing heavenward. It definitely has here symbolism. It has several steps leading up and with arrows pointing heavenward. As early as the first century, the pillar becomes a symbol for Jesus of Nazareth and the emerging church. Later, it even makes an appearance in the heart of the Vatican in Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel. But there is yet one more curious element to the exterior design. Two seemingly insignificant circular patterns, one on each side of the face of the ossuary. Interestingly, they are not positioned at the four corners of the ossuary's facade, as you would expect from something simply ornamental. Instead, there are only two of them, and they appear on either side of the pillar. According to the authoritative Rachmani catalog of ossuaries, the circles represent two nail heads. Simka is taken aback by his discovery and realizes that he doesn't know where in the tomb the missing Roman nails were found. Were they found somewhere close to the ostentatious ossuary? Or were they found closer to the more modest ossuary? Looking at the initial field report, written at the tomb's discovery, the evidence is inconclusive. One nail was found outside the fancy Caiaphas ossuary. Incredibly, the other was found inside an ossuary. But strangely, that ossuary is not identified. Why? Could it be that it was the plain Caiaphas ossuary? What do you make of a nail in an ossuary? At all sites, Anywhere in Jerusalem, I've dug right here in Jerusalem, we find 10 nails a day, but we're not in a Jewish tomb. We're in a residential area like this. I'm sure many nails were found right behind me when this was excavated. But if there's a nail in the ossuary, then it opens another possibility that there's something like the coins in the mouth of the skull, some sort of superstition going on here. Uh, the belief attested in a number of sources that a crucifixion nail has a great magical power to ward off evil, to ward off bad luck, maybe to help you in the afterlife. Can it be that it is the simple ossuary that belonged to the high priest and that the secret of the tomb is that Caiaphas took Jesus' nails with him to the grave? To answer that, we need the nails, but the nails are missing and there is no photograph of them in the original report. In the hope that the photographs do exist, Simka now tracks down the original photographer of the site. The photographer is Gero Nalbandian. He was hired by the archaeologists to photograph all the artifacts found in the tomb. So your mission was to shoot all the artifacts yes. from the tomb? Yes. OK, let's see what you have. That's the ossuary? Yes. This is the oil lamp. This is the coin. And the nails, did you shoot the nails? Uh, I, no. There were no nails? They did not give, show me the nails. But you asked for all the artifacts? Yes. What the artifacts, it was there from the tomb. They give it to me, I photograph it. No nails? No nails, I did not see nails. So the nails mysteriously disappeared before Garrow had a chance to photograph them for the final report. Something doesn't make sense. Nails just don't disappear. Israeli archaeologists aren't bad. They're good archaeologists. These are not simple nails that were found in a wooden coffin or a building site or in a boat. These were special Roman nails in Caiaphas's tomb, one of them inside one of the ossuaries. I just can't believe that they simply disappeared. 
As night falls, Simka gets back to the business of introducing a small camera in the now covered up tomb of Caiaphas. After hours of waiting, the second camera finally arrives. It is much smaller and more flexible than the one that got stuck earlier. Called a push camera, it has a better chance of moving past the obstructions in the pipe. Working into the night, the crew is finally able to maneuver the push camera past the screws that stopped them before. Oh. Okay, okay Abby, fill down. More, more. Okay, hold it right there. There it is. I see what's going on. Here's the ground, the way they yeah. found it. They went inside and they pulled out the ossuaries, and there's the entrance. Simka can now clearly see the outside of the tomb of the high priest Caiaphas. But there's a problem. That is cement. Because they had to put cement here to fortify whatever they were doing. The walls are reinforced with concrete. If you can get past that, can you get past that, Avi? Can you go a little bit more? The camera probe inside the pipe that leads to Caiaphas's tomb has hit another problem. That is cement. Can you go a little bit more? Can you maneuver it to the side? More, that's it. The camera won't reach all the way inside the Caiaphas tomb. The only way to do that would be to get an excavation license and drill new holes. Even if that were possible, the application process would take years. OK, so three meters, yeah. and there's probably another what? Two meters. From what we're looking ahead, yeah. The opening Meet is right here. here. The, the tomb roadway. is under this roadway right here. There's no getting into a tomb paved over by a road. But Simka has learned something. Now we know it exists. The entrance is unobstructed, and it's under this, this road. The point is, there's only one set of missing artifacts. It's the most important set, and that's the nails. Right. Unfortunately, Simka and his crew are unable to gain access to the tomb. If the nails are still inside, we'll never know. But can artifacts from tomb sites simply vanish? Simka has now asked to speak with Zvi Greenhut, the archaeologist who ran the Caiaphas tomb dig. Unfortunately, he has refused an interview. The IAA has offered up fellow archaeologist Gideon Avni to speak in his stead. In the tomb, there's two Roman nails. Okay. Doesn't someone go, wow, I've poured through the material. But there is no measurement or pictures of the nails. You have to realize, in this country, every year, you have 300 excavations. The number of artifacts found in these excavations goes to tens of millions. And minor elements, like nails, either they were lost in the stage of uh, uh, processing or uh, storage, or they were mixed with some other uh, context. I'm representing this government uh, institution. There was a question asked about this nail. We checked all the records relevant to uh, this tomb, and we discovered that we don't have the nails. Nails can be either lost or found their way into some uh, uh, other uh, registry or whatever. When you said it could be lost or find itself in some other registry, you mean like not really lost, but internally misfiled in a way? It's a possibility. Meaning it could be sitting in, in some lab or a shelf? Maybe. Gideon Avni has made me think. Maybe the nails have been under our noses the whole time. If my hunch is right, and the Israeli archaeologists who were involved in the Caiaphas tomb suspected that the Roman nails found there had something to do with crucifixion, maybe they send them to Professor Herskovich's lab at Tel Aviv University. Now, he's a forensic anthropologist. He deals with bone, not nails. But crucifixion is where bone meets nail. So maybe someone sent the nails there. Maybe that's the right address for our investigation. We've been tracking two nails that went missing, the Antiquities Authority, they say it's probably misplaced. Did, did you ever get two nails together? Yes, we have two nails uh, together. Yes, sure. From Jerusalem? From Jerusalem. Uh, can, we go, <laughs> can we go look? Sure, absolutely. So these are the nails? 
Yes, these are the two nails from Jerusalem that arrived to the lab more than 15 years ago from the Second Temple period. Could it be 18 years ago? Yeah, could be. It's the only example of two nails arriving together. Yes. The fact that they're bent this way, would this be consistent with crucifixion? It could be. Why would they bend the nail? If you put a nail through the palm of the hand, you can, you can easily free the hand. But if you put a nail through the palm of the hand, and then you stick it to the wood by actually bending the nail, the palm of the hand are attached firmly to the cross but So the fact they're bent is more consistent with crucifixion than if you saw them straight? Yes, I would say so. The Caiaphas nails were found in a specific chemical setting. One was outside the limestone ossuaries, and one was inside an ossuary. If these are the Caiaphas nails, one should have a heavy limestone deposit collected from inside the ossuary, and one should be limestone free since it was found outside the ossuaries. Incredibly, that's just what Professor Herskovitz finds. One doesn't have limestone on it, but the other one does. So what do you see? There are remnants of lime on the nail, you know, limestone. Most ossuaries are made of uh, limestone. Furthermore, Professor Herskovitz finds that the heads of the nails are similar to the only crucifixion nail found anywhere, which is also in Professor Herskovitz's lab. So it seems that these are the missing nails, the nails which may have come from Jesus's cross. Why is nobody as excited as I am? You know, crucifixion is a very sensitive issue from the religious point of view. I believe that most people prefer to leave it aside. So it seems that religious sensitivities, not science, dictated policy towards these nails. If Caiaphas kept the nails of Jesus for whatever reasons, he felt bad, he felt it would have healing powers, he felt that this shows he has power over him, whatever, this could be the nails of the crucifixion. Here on the campus of Tel Aviv University, our investigation is complete. The fact is that the world may be looking at the wrong Caiaphas ossuary. The man buried in the modest one may be the high priest who faced Jesus at his trial. Furthermore, I think we've made the strongest archaeological argument ever that two of the nails used in the crucifixion have been found. Hidden in the pages of the Christian Bible are clues to a mysterious sea voyage. According to the Gospels, Jesus and his disciples travel to a place called the land of the Gadarenes. Where is this place? Why did Jesus journey there? If the clues can be decoded, will a secret history finally be revealed? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Sunka Yakubovich, from deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land. Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Behind me is a small lake in northern Israel known as the Sea of Galilee. According to Christian tradition, it's the location for one of the most dramatic episodes in Jesus' life. It's when he gets on a boat, encounters a big storm, exorcises a demon, and comes face to face with the mysterious people that the Gospels call the Gadarenes. Who are these people? And why did Jesus risk his life to get to them? You know what? I think we can buck 2,000 years of tradition and show that Jesus' voyage did not take place here. In fact, I think we can figure out exactly where he went to and why. More than that, I think we can take you to the land of the Gadarenes, and it's not across this lake. But before we do, let's look at the story as it's been told and understood for thousands of years. Almost 2,000 years of tradition says that Jesus' dramatic journey took place here, on the freshwater lake known as the Sea of Galilee and that the land of the Gadarenes is somewhere on these shores. This is one of the most important stories in the Gospels, 
because it's the only time that Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, ministers to non-Jews, setting the precedent for the Christian church. The story of the sea and the storm is highly important because it will basically draw the main theme of the entire gospel. And the main theme of the gospel is Jesus' message is to the entire world. Although the gospels never name the body of water that Jesus crossed, they do lay out a set of very clear clues as to his destination. The Gospel of Matthew records that Jesus traveled with the 12 disciples, and there arose a great tempest in the sea. But surprisingly, Jesus was fast asleep, and the ship was covered with waves. Taking the Gospels at their word, is there evidence here on the Sea of Galilee of ships from the time of Jesus large enough to sleep in through a storm? Luckily, there is a boat that can be examined. It was discovered in 1986 on the shores of the lake. Tests show that the ancient fishing boat dates to 2,000 years ago, the time of Jesus. Pilgrims travel from around the world to see this astonishing discovery, which has become known as the Jesus boat. From the beginning, we knew that we were working on something very special here. So it dates to? It's the times of Jesus, yeah. It, you can't ever prove that Jesus was on it or even saw it. There were about 600 boats uh, working in this lake at that time. It's enough, it's from that time, from that place, it's the only one, and this is how they look like. Archaeologists agree that this was the largest class of boat to sail the tiny Galilee. But a ride in a replica makes the holes in the story obvious. If the voyage took place here, Jesus, all of his disciples, and maybe even a crew, would have had to squeeze onto this relatively small boat. And the Gospels are unequivocal. There was a great tempest, waves crashed over the ship, and Jesus slept through the storm. So is this a good ship to go sleeping in? You can sleep in it, but not in a storm. The waves are coming over it and they're swamping the boat, and you can be sleeping on nets, but you will be thrown around by the waves. It's the That's worst very... place in the boat. It's the place that jumps, you know, left to right, up and down. Ropes are flying and sails, the sailors... Sailors are panicking. They're panicking and make noise and everything, and people are shouting and panic. If the boat doesn't match the one described in the story, the storm is even more mystifying. The Christian Bible clearly describes a powerful tempest that swamps Jesus' boat. This lake doesn't produce storms like the one described in the Gospels. Also, when there are the occasional storms, you're never more than 15 minutes from the shore, hardly the stuff to panic experienced fishermen like Jesus' disciples. After all, according to the Gospels, at least four of the 12 were professional fishermen. Neither the boat, the storm, nor the description of Jesus sleeping through the powerful tempest fit this location. But what about the other clues mentioned in the Gospels? Do any of them fit the Sea of Galilee? The Gospel of Mark says that Jesus traveled across the water to the land of the Gadarenes. And directly on the shore was a necropolis, or city of the dead. Living among the tombs of that necropolis was a possessed man, or demonic. Jesus exercises the demons from the possessed man, sending them into a herd of 2,000 pigs. The swine immediately plunge off the cliffs, into the sea, and drown. If this story really took place on the Sea of Galilee, where is the necropolis? Where are the tombs, the pigs, and the land of the Gadarenes? Around the lake, pilgrims point to three candidates for Jesus' destination. From his base in Capernaum, they say Jesus would have sailed east. So the first candidate for the land of the Gadarenes is a place that is today called Kersey. Less than nine kilometers from Capernaum, it's the largest ancient port on the Sea of Galilee. Is this the land of the Gadarenes, 
where the miracle of the exorcism of the possessed man took place? Strengthening Kersey's claim is the fact that 400 years after Jesus, Christians built a monastery here, marking the spot where they believed Jesus landed. What convinces you that historically speaking, that it actually it is the place where Jesus sailed to? The thing that sells it for us is we take the New Testament seriously. Uh, Jesus came in a boat. This is the only place you can come to by boat across the lake. And so... Uh, by the, process of elimination. That's it. And, and the fact that this church was built tells us that this miracle happened somewhere around here. Except that they may have done what you just did, come here and say, well, it couldn't have been there, yeah. couldn't have been there. It says cliff, by golly, there's a cliff. Yeah. And decided it that way. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that happened. Pilgrims found a port and a couple of 50 meter high cliffs set back from the shore and decided that this must be the land of the Gadarenes. Looking at the cliffs, they saw a few caves and they decided these had to be the tombs mentioned in the Gospels. One of these has been designated the tomb of the demonic since the fifth century. What leads you to think that there's even a tomb here? We know that in the first century, caves were used for burial. And here we have a large cave and there's some others here in the area. So that leads us to believe that these were areas were used for tombs and believed to be the tomb in which the demoniac would have lived why do we think that? Just because there's a caves? There's no necropolis here. It's just the caves are our best one, example one, of one cave. This was the largest, and usually you'll take the largest and say that's the cave. In fact, ongoing excavations show no evidence of a tomb or a necropolis here. And there's one last problem with the checklist. A large herd of pigs hardly seems plausible in a Jewish country. Let me ask you, have you found pig bones here? You know, I don't think we have. Uh, we found every other kind of bone, just about. But you found no ancient pig bones? No, not that I know of. Because of all this, even the early pilgrims weren't fully satisfied with this location, so they kept looking. Two kilometers away, at a place called Hippos, they marked another site with the church, just in case the land of the Gadarenes was further inland. I'm standing at the site of ancient Hippos. You could see it's being excavated. It's not quite open to the public yet. It's literally being unearthed right now. And right over there, you see the Sea of Galilee. So this is one of the great candidates for where the miracle of the swine, the demonics happened. But there's a problem. It's not on the sea. There are no cliffs right next to the water. There's no necropolis or city of the dead. So there's a lot of problems with it. The only part of Kersey in Hippos that matches our checklist are the cliffs. But they are hardly impressive, and they're far from the water. And yet, there is one final candidate in this area for the land of the Gadarenes, one which attracts more pilgrims than any other. The reason for its popularity is that it's actually called Gadara. So this is the gate to Gadara? This is the gate of the first century AD. To Gadara. So we're talking Jesus' time? Yeah, this is Jesus' time. When 5th century Christian pilgrims came here, they found a necropolis that suggested a connection to the Gospels and built a church over the most impressive tomb. The people who built this church believed that uh, this could be the place of the man with the demons inside and the story with the pigs and that Jesus came to this place and exorcised uh, these demons. Here, the name of the city, the necropolis, the size of the tomb, and even the cliff-like escarpment suggests a match with the Gospels. But there is a problem. The Gospel of Mark explicitly says that the cliffs and the necropolis were right by the sea. But we're very far from the Sea of Galilee, right? Uh, that's right. It's a problem, of course, but you see, it's a miracle. And the uh, people just believed in the story. But it's a six kilometer hike. That's it. But um, you don't have to look 
uh, word by word of this miracle. In fact, Gadara doesn't really match the story at all. It's not only far from the water, but there's no evidence of an ancient port anywhere at the southern end of the lake. Nowhere at all for Jesus to land. The necropolis at Gadara has no port, and the port at Kursi has no necropolis. Hippos doesn't match at all, and the Sea of Galilee is too small. The boat, too small. The destinations are too close. Nothing in this story matches with this Holy Land location. So if Jesus didn't cross the Sea of Galilee, what body of water did he cross? Where did he go and why? Interestingly, at the time of Jesus, there was one other city named Gadara, not on the Sea of Galilee, but far, far away across the Mediterranean in southern Spain. The Gospels tell us that Jesus embarked on a sea voyage to a mysterious place called the Land of the Gadarenes. Most people place the Gadarenes somewhere on the Sea of Galilee, but as we've seen, nothing, absolutely nothing here fits that story. So where did Jesus go and why? To answer those questions, Simca heads to Jerusalem to look at an original Greek version of the Gospel of Luke. Of the three Gospels that mention the voyage, Luke is the earliest, because it relies on an even earlier version that scholars call the Q source. In the library of the Rockefeller Museum, he meets biblical scholar James Tabor, and together they find that Jesus does give a clue as to what his mission was all about. We're going back to the original Greek. The original Greek, but also the original Greek of what we call the Q source. Now the Q source is now in Luke. It's embedded in Luke. Meaning there's a source before Hidden the Gospels that he had that's that embedded had. in. And it's a, the earliest collection of the sayings of Jesus. So he, I've got a page of Luke here, and it's the best one. And it says, he begins to say to them, an evil generation seeks a sign. So this is the Greek word for sign? Yeah. And it's what? It's semeon. And then he just makes this absolutely declarative statement. There will be no sign given, but the sign of Yonah. There's Yonah. I see Yonah. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people, when they read this, they say, oh, but I know what the sign of Jonah is. That's that Jesus would be in the tomb three days and three nights, like Jonah was in the belly of the fish. But this text doesn't say that. That's very important. He's yeah. talking code. He says, uh, you're evil for wanting a sign, but you're going to get a sign. You're going to get the sign of Jonah. So the code here is sign of Jonah. In other words, and it doesn't mean the sign of Jonah, meaning a sign that Jonah gave. It means Jonah is the sign. So whatever so, Jonah did in his time. That's what you would look at to decode the sign. Right. Let's look at what Jonah did. The prophet Jonah is best known for a sea journey gone bad. After surviving a storm, Jonah ends up in the belly of a whale or a great fish. Is Jesus telling us that he's following in the wake of the prophet Jonah, who undertook a sea voyage some 700 years earlier? After all, Jonah was in a storm. Jesus was in a storm. Jonah fell asleep during the storm, and so did Jesus. Jonah quelled the storm. Jesus quelled the storm. What if Jesus is telling us that whatever mission Jonah was on, Jesus was on the same mission? If we're going to rediscover the lost voyage of Jesus, we have to trace the journey of Jonah. And that journey had nothing to do with the tiny lake of Galilee. Jonah's voyage began in the ancient Mediterranean port of Jaffa in the land of Israel. Can it be that by following Jonah, Jesus began his journey in the port of Jaffa and sailed across the Mediterranean. We shouldn't assume that people in this period didn't travel and travel all the way to France and Spain. It was done all the time, especially by seafaring people and military people. So we tend to think of Jesus as this quaint guy who just walked around the lake all day and talked to fishermen. But here we have this story that doesn't seem to fit. 
a little lake in a storm. And essentially he says in Greek, let's go across. He doesn't call it a lake. It says he gets into the boat, and that's when he falls asleep in the stern. And there's this, he says, a great storm. And then he says, and he went across the thalassa. Thalassa is not the word for lake. Now, all these words, you say, well, it could mean lake, it could mean ocean. But it's the normal word for sea. If Jesus' journey began here in the port of Jaffa, and he was following in Jonah's footsteps, it's clear where he would have been heading. The Bible tells us that Jonah was heading to a place called Tarshish. Scholars generally agree that Tarshish is ancient Tartessos in southern Spain, somewhere beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. The area called Tarshish in Jonah's time was called Gadara in Jesus' time. They were sailing to the same place. The details provided in the gospel suddenly make sense. On the Mediterranean Sea, ships have always been large enough to fall asleep in during a storm. If Jesus and his disciples were sailing towards ancient Gadara, now modern Cadiz, then there should be impressive cliffs here, traditions of demonics, a pig-centered culture, and finally, a necropolis by the sea. On the way to ancient Gadara, one must first pass through the Straits of Gibraltar. Gibraltar is famous for some of the most remarkable cliffs in the world. Rounding the southern tip of Spain, ships sail into the waters of Cadiz, ancient Gadara. Today, Cadiz sits on a peninsula. However, geologists tell us that in Jesus' time, before it silted up, Gadara was situated on a large island, part of an archipelago of islands located at the very edge of the known world. Matching the Gospels, this area is world famous for the black Iberian pig. For more than 2,000 years, these animals have been the mainstay of the local diet. And the most famous festival here is the annual carnival. Incredibly, once again, matching the Gospels, the central figure of the celebration is a demonic. According to the Gospels, the demonic lived in a tomb in a necropolis by the sea. Have any tombs been discovered under the streets of modern Cadiz? In fact, there have been, and they contained some of the most magnificent marble coffins found anywhere in the world. But what about the necropolis that once housed such breathtaking coffins? Have any of the tombs survived? A site just a few kilometers inland from Cadiz may hold the answer. Y últimamente a través del estudio de unas fotografías aéreas hemos podido ver el lugar donde se hacían los barcos, donde se guardaban las mercancías. Esta es una ciudad de portuaria. Tenemos un puerto que no hay nada parecido en todo el Mediterráneo. According to Professor Mata, Dona Blanca was the ancient port of Cadiz. Geological research shows that 2,000 years ago, instead of flatlands, there was a rocky shore here and a sharp drop off around the ruined city. There were cliffs like the ones described in the Gospels, and there were tombs. Lots of tombs. Está la, la ciudad, que es donde estamos ahora, a la espalda. La necrópolis es una necrópolis enorme. Son dos millones de metros cuadrados. Ahí, en el siglo I, veía una ciudad pequeña y llena de tumbas. Muchas tumbas. Miles de tumbas, lo que se pueda ver en su día, que se vería con árboles. Se verían las tumbas, el agua corría, seguramente. Era una estructura de jardín, de paraíso, ¿no? Necrópolis. Eso lo vería, pues no estando en uso, evidentemente, y las tumbas abandonadas. 
If Jesus sailed into this necropolis, he might have seen an abandoned burial site, a demonic living in an ancient tomb, and swine grazing among the trees. But of the 5,000 tombs found here, only one has been excavated. Professor Mata agrees to take Simca to it. This excavation has never been filmed or published. The tomb conforms to the traditions of the early Canaanites and Israelites. In a Spanish context, scholars call these people Phoenicians. Clearly, this tomb is big enough for a demonic to live in. In fact, Professor Mata has a surprise for Simca. Pues cuando esto lo excavamos y ya lo dejamos, eh, pues cuando volvimos al siguiente año encontramos que había un señor aquí viviendo, un pobre viviendo. There was a man living in the tomb. Sí, 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 sí. 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 Clearly, we're in the right area. We seem to be in the general area described by the Gospels as the goal of Jesus' journey. But around here, you have several necropolis by the sea. The one at Gadara is not the only one. And it would seem to me that if Jesus did come here, there would be some kind of oral tradition preserving that event. So I want to find the exact spot where Jesus landed. Simca believes the area of Cadiz, called Gadara in ancient times, is the land of the Gadarenes mentioned in the Christian Bible. He also believes that this was Jesus' destination when he embarked on the sea voyage recounted in the Gospels. But there is no oral tradition that Jesus made landfall here, so he's now looking for a nearby island that has the physical characteristics required, along with a living tradition that Jesus was there. The key is the storm described in the Gospels. If the storm defines where Jesus made landfall, then it would have to be around the Balearic Islands, just off Spain, an area notorious for its life-threatening gales. If Jesus set sail from the port of Jaffa across the Mediterranean, what would have happened? He probably would have been caught in a storm. That's what happens. And sailing then was a little more dangerous than sailing today. And when that happened, when you were caught in a tempest, sailors set sail for the largest of the Balearic Islands here, Mallorca. And if you came into this safe harbor, or one like it, you're confronted with cliffs on the one hand, that's the geology of the place, but the culture of the place is cities of the dead, dwellings of the dead, tombs. As in nearby Cadiz, the geography of this area fits the story in the Gospels. As in Cadiz, the people here buried their dead on the beaches in tombs large enough for the living to take refuge in. Like the necropolis just outside Cadiz, this necropolis was already 700 years old by the time Jesus was born. If Jesus did come here, some of his first followers, all of them from Israel and all of them Jewish, would have followed in his footsteps after the crucifixion. But is there any hard archaeology linking this island with those early Hebrew-speaking followers of Jesus? Hidden away in a corner of the Archaeological Museum of Majorca, there are three lead Hebrew-inscribed anchors found in a Christian necropolis. Anchors are perhaps the earliest Christian symbols. Someone was literally buried with them. Ah, oh, that's really heavy. Y aparecieron en un contexto de necrópolis. Necrópolis? Sí. Se llaman paleocristianos porque son los más antiguos que están documentados en que tuvieran presencia en, en la isla. Y que las tres llevan una inscripción en alfabeto hebreo. The Hebrew inscription names the man buried with these anchors. He was called Samuel, son of Hanai. Suddenly, Simca notices something. I have a surprise for you. There's more inscriptions here, more ancient inscriptions. See here? I see here, this looks like 
either an Aleph or a Mem. This is a Shin. Let me get this straight. Somebody was buried with us? Sí. Las lápidas fueron halladas sobre una sepultura con el cuerpo orientado hacia Jerusalén. Simca's discovery draws the attention of the head curator of the museum. This is our Yehusha. It may say from Jerusalem. Have you ever seen this before? No, never. We've discovered an, a new inscription. That's right. Right in the place where Jesus would have had to take shelter if he was caught in a Mediterranean storm, Simca has tracked down a second century Jewish Christian burial that is commemorated with anchors. He's also discovered an inscription that seems to point to Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish Christian movement after the crucifixion. These anchors could be archeological evidence that Jesus' earliest Hebrew followers lived in Majorca. But is there any tradition or physical evidence that Jesus actually set foot on this island? Incredibly, all it takes is a question to the driver to reveal that there is a local tradition claiming that Jesus came here and left his footprint as a permanent reminder of his voyage to Majorca. Well, there's a little sign here, Ermita de Bethlehem. Yeah, right. Do you know what is Armita? Armita is so, a holy place. It used to be a place for pilgrimage, yeah. There pilgrimage? A, it's, yeah, it's a sort of pilgrimage place. Yeah. You're kidding. Simca's driver takes him to the footprint that locals treat with veneration. Mira, yo, mis abuelos, cuando yo era pequeño, baby, pequeño, mis abuelos cuando me llevaban a Bonay, siempre me hacían pisar hacia que la gente decían que ahí está la marca de cuando Jesús vino a visitar la Virgen que había esta piedra aquí. Did I understand him correctly? He said that Jesus came to yeah. visit. Yeah. This is not Israel. This is not Jerusalem. Why is there a tradition that Jesus was here? Pero era una tradición muy antigua esto. Mi abuela y esto ya su madre y ya antes ya, o sea que esto ya los años que tiene que hacer mucho una tradición muy antigua. It seems clear that Mallorca was an early Christian colony. The evidence suggests that Jesus himself may have journeyed here. Does this island preserve a lost tradition? Since some of Jesus' earliest followers included members of his family, is it possible that Simca can now come face to face with their forgotten descendants? Traditionally, people have assumed that Jesus never, ever left the shores of the Holy Land. But our investigation has led us to the conclusion that his famous journey to the land of the Gadarenes, mentioned in three of the four Gospels, was not a nine-kilometer trek across a tiny lake called Galilee, but an epic voyage across the Mediterranean to Spain. We have revealed that the geology, geography, culture, and archaeology mentioned in the Gospels match southern Spain and nowhere else. In fact, on the island of Majorca, we found a living tradition that Jesus made landfall there. There's even a stone revered as a cast of his foot. After the crucifixion, his movement, which included disciples and family, were on the run from the Roman authorities. Is it possible that they literally followed in their master's footsteps? Is it possible that Majorca is home to his descendants, sometimes called the Ebionites? Did the Ebionites think of Jesus the way other Christians do? They would probably think of Jesus more as a human being. He was on a mission sent by God. He was in the long lineage of the kind of uh, prophets and leaders of ancient Israel. But he was a human being. They would never have thought of him as a, as a divinity or a son of God. Let's say they were still alive, their descendants. What would have been preserved? What traditions? First of all, I think it's a remarkable idea. I mean, it's a question that's never been asked before because everybody assumes that the Ebonites disappeared from history. And 
I think it's very possible that that uh, tradition could survive. And I think there would be a consciousness, at least, of uh, being descended from his first followers. His first followers in Jerusalem included family members. But if they're still around, is that possible that 2,000 years after the crucifixion, there would be echoes of some of these traditions? There probably would be, but it be, would be a diminishing kind of echo. But there would still be Jewish practices, Jewish beliefs, and I think a kind of a Jewish sensibility. Simka now inquires if there are any people claiming traditions like these in Majorca. Ebionites means poor ones. He now discovers that there is a movement in Majorca known as the Poor Church. Could this group possess remnants of Ebionite beliefs? Is it possible that some of these people are of the bloodline of Jesus? Simca learns that like the Ebionites, these Catholics are attracted to Judaism and believe in Jesus not as a god, but as a Jewish teacher. Él siempre se sentía arraigado a ese a ese a ese judío del principio, a ese judaísmo, pero él hablaba siempre de las enseñanzas del de Jesús, no como las han explicado las religiones, sino como tal vez las vivía Jesús. Siempre ha hablado de un Jesús que murió, vivió como cualquier otra persona y que no resucitó. This perfectly matches the beliefs of the Ebionites. Even more astounding, the group's main spiritual leader, Cayetano, who recently passed away, taught that they were descendants of Jesus and his original Jewish followers. In the room are Cayetano's brother, daughter, and granddaughter. I'm very interested in this tradition and the family that you are from the family of Jesus. Nosotros somos descendientes de los judíos que vinieron a Mallorca. Cayetano habló de posibles descendientes de Jesús en su familia. Lo que le has preguntado a José, es verdad, él decía tan tranquilo que que él era eh, hijo de hijo de Jesús. Pero lo decía tan tranquilo. Y yo le decía, tú sabes lo que el papel que nos has dado, nos has dado una piedra caliente que cualquiera, cualquiera la tiene en las manos. Según él decía, pues murió allí, pero que vino su, o sea, que eh, en teoría se casó con María Magdalena y que tuvo tuvieron a Juan. Has comentado de que Magdalena es un apellido, es un nombre muy extendido aquí y que puede que puede a lo mejor tener algún tipo de vinculación con, con pues con esa venida de los familiares de Jesús porque claro cuando se habla de la tradición oral pues era una cosa que si se hablaba de esto pues uno podía ser tildado de, de loco If these people are right this young girl is a direct descendant of Jesus or his disciples or at least his first Jewish followers. But she seems more interested in their religious beliefs than her bloodline. Nunca me han llamado la atención. Es decir, me interesa a lo mejor el judaísmo como religión, el judaísmo como historia, pero no no tengo interés de ni saber si yo soy descendiente, no no sé. Is this really possible? Are these people of the bloodline of Jesus? If Jesus did come here, and if the Gospels recorded the journey, why have we not known about it until now? The Gospels record a sea voyage by Jesus to a place we've traced in southern Spain. Jesus thought this mission was so important that he tells one of his disciples to get on the boat instead of burying his father. He tells him, let the dead bury the dead. Essentially, he's telling him to break one of the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. What could be so important? Jesus says that if you want to understand him, we've got to look at Jonah. He calls it the sign of Jonah. And as we've seen, Jonah too traveled to southern Spain. Why? Just when you say the word Spain, to me, uh, in my field, it rings all kinds of bells. Because in the prophets, it's the ends of the earth, and the Messiah has to reach to the ends of the earth. There's something in the agenda of a Messiah that people tend to forget. 
He's got to do a number of things, basically three things. He's going to sit on a throne and rule over his people. And he's going to bring peace and justice to the world. But the third thing that's often forgotten is he's got to bring in the rest of the tribes of Israel that are not living in the land during the time of Jesus. Ten of the 12 tribes of biblical Israel were exiled from the Holy Land around 700 BC. One of these tribes was called Gad. At the same time as the exile of the tribe of Gad, historians tell us that a colony was established in southern Spain. In fact, most places in the area, such as Guadalquivir, Guadiana, and Guadalat, include the Spanish word for Gad in their names. Interestingly, the Israelite tribe of Gad originated on the eastern side of the Jordan River, where the only other city of Gadara existed. Can it be that the exiled Gadarenes that once lived in modern-day Jordan made their way to southern Spain? Amazingly, to this day, people living in Cadiz don't call themselves Cadizians. Rather, they call themselves Gaditanos, Gadites. But is there any hard archaeological evidence linking the lost tribe of Gad to Spanish Gadara? Overlooked in a corner of the Museum of Cadiz is an ancient inscription that dates to the 7th century BC, the time of Jonah, when the tribe of Gad would have arrived here. The inscription is in Hebrew and it reads, My father is Gad. If Jesus, like Jonah, was trying to return the lost tribe of Gad, he failed. The Gospels tell us that the Gadarenes asked him to get back on his ship and go back where he came from. It seems that when the Gospel writers set this story to paper, they removed some important details. They shrouded the land of the Gadarenes in mystery, leading pilgrims to situate it in the Galilee, a place where it doesn't belong. Could it be that the big secret of the trip to Gadara is that actually Jesus failed? Because the Gadarenes clearly say, get back on that boat and get out of here. He does say that he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Fish and sheep are the two images of the lost tribes. I'll raise a shepherd and he'll bring back the lost sheep tell stories about lost sheep, and then fishing, pulling fish in. Since he doesn't do it, it's not something the Gospels would report triumphantly. There's no record of huge numbers from Spain, you know, coming to Jerusalem and saying, here we are. So maybe if it's a fail mission, you just uh, lose it or forget it. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, I don't know. If it was a failed mission, that would explain why the story has been lost. It would also suggest that his closest followers would have expected the second coming to occur in Spain. They would have expected him to succeed where he had once failed. Perhaps that's why James, son of Zebedee, one of the 12 disciples, followed in Jesus' footsteps. He went to Spain and tradition holds he was buried there, making Santiago de Compostela the third most important pilgrimage destination in all of Christendom. And what about Paul? It may surprise people to learn that Paul was also determined to go to Spain. Romans 15, 24 states explicitly that Paul was on his way to Spain, and the earliest evidence outside the Christian Bible suggests that he got there. The tribe of Gad did not sail to the Holy Land with Jesus. Nonetheless, it seems that Jesus' most intimate followers believed that the second coming would only happen when the Gadites, the Gadarenes of the Gospels, rejoined the Jewish people. As it turns out, there may have been repentant Gadarenes who did journey to Jerusalem after the crucifixion. 
Incredibly, at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, a holy site for Christians and the traditional location of the crucifixion, hidden from public view is Christianity's earliest inscription. And it may be the defining evidence that at least one member of the tribe of Gad came home. A door behind the altar leads to a tunnel and a long walk beneath the traditional site of Jesus' burial. Secret chapel. And there, next to an altar dedicated to the Virgin Mary, is a second century graffiti of a seafaring boat. Beneath it, there's a Latin inscription suggesting that it came from the West. The man or woman who drew this may very well have come from Spain. What we can see here is a boat which, where you can see the mast. The sails are in red, very difficult to see. You can see the oars, you can see the steering tail. You've got everything here. I see here a, a pilgrim coming from the western part of the empire. It can be as far as Spain. He says two things. First of all, see how I came here by boat. But the most important and most significant thing is the inscription which says Domine, Ivimus, in Latin, which means, O oh Lord, we have come. 2,000 years of Christian tradition says that Jesus never left the Holy Land and that his famous sea voyage was across this tiny lake. I think we've made a powerful case that this is not where the voyage took place. It took place across the Mediterranean. He didn't go to modern-day Jordan. He went to modern-day Spain. He went there to fulfill his messianic, his messiah agenda. At the beginning of the Christian movement, Jesus' followers were fed to wild animals for Roman entertainment. Then, as the story goes, the Roman Emperor Constantine had a vision of the cross, which inspired him to adopt Jesus as his savior. As a result, the West became Christian. But did Constantine really convert to Christianity? Or are modern Christians worshiping a version of Jesus created by a die-hard pagan? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovic. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Simka has come to Turkey, to the city of Istanbul. Back in the fourth century AD, Constantine built his new capital here and called it Constantinople. By that point, Constantine had already legalized Christianity, but it's still a matter of controversy whether Constantine himself became a true Christian. I'm underneath modern Istanbul, the city that Constantine built. Until Constantine, some 300 years after the crucifixion, Christianity was essentially an illegal movement. After Constantine, within a few years, a few decades, it would become the official religion of the Roman Empire and the reason why so much of the world today is Christian. The question is, who was he? And the religion that he created, is it a religion that Jesus would recognize? In the fourth century AD, the Roman Empire was divided into four major areas. Each region had its own ruler. But when Constantine's father, who ruled the West, died in York, England in the year 306, his army declared Constantine ruler of the entire Roman Empire. This sparked a bloody struggle to determine who would end up emperor. In the year 312, Constantine was pitted against the general Maxentius, who controlled the central region, including the city of Rome. Their famous struggle for power was depicted 1,200 years later in these frescoes by Renaissance artist Raphael. Based on early Christian sources, Raphael painted these narratives on the Vatican walls. And it's these frescoes that tell us the traditional story of how Constantine converted to Christianity. But there's a much older work of art that tells a different tale. It's called the Arch of Constantine. 
and Constantine himself had it built here, in the center of Rome, to celebrate his victory over Maxentius. Over six stories high, Constantine's arch was erected just 91 meters from the Colosseum, where Christians were once killed for sport. For fear of damage, the Department of Antiquities in Rome hasn't given anyone permission to examine it up close for more than 30 years, until now. The closest you can get to Constantine is the arch behind me across from the Colosseum. It's Constantine's victory arch, and on it he sculpted his narrative. The problem is you can't get close to it. In 30 years, no one has. But now, we're gonna go up and take a look. In his quest to decode the arch, Simca is joined by Constantine expert Elizabeth Marlowe, who has seen the carvings on Constantine's arch only from ground level or in photographs. Until now, she has never seen them up close. Oh my God, look at that. That is so fantastic. Look how big they are. From this elevated perspective, Simca can now see how Constantine wanted his victory over Maxentius depicted in stone for all time. This is amazing. I'm excited it's like a It's spectacular to be up here. Everyone should see Constantine's arch this way. Constantine's arch depicts the battle between Constantine and Maxentius for strategic control of the Milvian Bridge, just north of Rome. According to the tradition depicted in Raphael's paintings, Constantine's forces were greatly outnumbered. But then, Constantine is said to have had a vision of the cross, followed by a dream of Jesus that changed his life and ours forever. In that moment, Constantine was said to have denounced the Roman paganism that he was brought up with in favor of a newfound belief in Christianity. He ordered his soldiers to paint their shields and banners with the symbol of the cross and led his army to victory. He then went on to convert the entire Roman world to the Christian faith. That's what the Christian tradition tells us. But what does Constantine's arch have to say? In this panel, Constantine's face was deliberately hacked out by a long forgotten opponent to his legacy. Here, we can still clearly see the defeated Maxentius drowning in the river Tiber. But is there any evidence that Constantine really had a vision of the cross that converted him to Christianity? Who's that guy behind him? That's one of his own men carrying a standard. That's a military standard. No cross there. No cross there. You can't see that from down below. No. I see a shield very clearly. Yes. No cross there. No, no. When we look at the evidence from Constantine's reign itself, the Arch of Constantine really being the best source we have in the years immediately following that battle, there's no trace of Christianity on this monument. No images of Jesus, no crosses, no Christian symbolism anywhere on his arch. Considering his vision, you would think Constantine would be championing Christianity. Is it possible that there was no vision at all? In Constantine's day, emperors had to win over the Roman army. Was the vision invented to win over Christian soldiers? But wait a minute, the Roman army persecuted Christians. It crucified Jesus. There wouldn't have been Christians in the Roman army. Maybe there were. To investigate the possibility of Christians in Constantine's army, Simca travels to Northern England, once the outer reaches of the Roman Empire. It's here where Constantine's rise to power began. The area is littered with Roman military forts, like this one, located at Hadrian's Wall on the Scottish border. And it's here that Andrew Burley has found evidence of Christians in the Roman army. Now, what do you make of it? Well, this is not a random thing. This is a very purposeful thing. Now, corresponding with the cross inside the, the room in this building here, on the section of the wall next door, there are seven crosses like this one inserted into the wall, all in one section of wall. To have seven so close together is very unusual. 
third century Christian symbols carved into stone, but the same Roman army that crucified Jesus. Evidence that Christians were fighting in Constantine's army, even before Constantine came to power. Winning them over would have been of paramount importance. But were Christian soldiers also serving in his rival Maxentius's army? There would be much more likely to be Christians in, in Maxentius's army than in Constantine. And Constantine's army was largely composed of people from, from the far barbarian north where Christianity had made very much less impact. So it seems Christians were well entrenched in the Roman military before either Constantine or Maxentius fought their famous battle for the Milvian Bridge. But if Maxentius also led Christians into his army, then what's so unique about Constantine's claim to be a Christian sympathizer? To learn more, Simca needs to find out what Maxentius really stood for. The only personal relics from Maxentius's reign were recently unearthed here, just meters from Constantine's arch, by archaeologist Clementina Panella. Panella believes that these royal scepters, spears, and weapons belong to Maxentius himself and were venerated by his faithful followers, just as Christians venerate the cross. Ritrovato il corpo di Massenzio, Costantino taglia la testa di Massenzio e la porta in città. E Costantino, ovviamente, avendo vinto col sangue, deve dare del nemico la peggiore presentazione. Quindi Massenzio è il tiranno. I panegirici dicono le cose più terribili di questo Massenzio, i vizi più turpi gli sono attribuiti e la memoria di Massenzio viene, come al solito, cancellata. Upon his victory, Constantine tried to wipe Maxentius from history's good books by portraying him as a pagan tyrant and a Christian persecutor. Però Massenzio invece è stato un grande imperatore e Massenzio non diede fastidio ai cristiani. E io mi chiedo che cosa sarebbe successo eh, se Costantino non avesse vinto. Che cosa sarebbe successo della nostra civiltà che poi è piena di cristianesimo e noi siamo dei discendenti di questa, ma di questa battaglia. So if the image we have of Maxentius as an evil pagan tyrant has been fabricated, is it possible that the image we have of Constantine as a Christian emperor has also been fabricated? To answer that question, Simca now investigates a secret religion that claimed the most powerful people in the empire as its followers. This religion worshipped a pagan god who had an uncanny resemblance to Jesus. Early Christian history states that the Roman Emperor Constantine received a divine vision of Jesus before defeating his arch-rival Maxentius, winning control of the Roman Empire and causing the Western world to become Christian. But was Constantine a true Christian? The most important statement we have from him is his triumphal arch in Rome. On it, Simca doesn't find a single Christian icon, but he does find pagan symbols. On this panel, Constantine is surrounded by pagan gods, the god of the river Tiber, a winged goddess of victory, and by Roma, goddess of Rome, an archeological patchwork of pagan symbolism, compelling evidence that Constantine only adopted Christian ideas to gain favor with Roman soldiers in both his and Maxentius's armies. But winning over common soldiers wasn't enough. To gain control over the entire Roman Empire, Constantine needed the support of the officer corps and the Roman elite. Many members of these classes belonged to a mysterious cult that had been around since before Jesus. That cult was called Mithraism, named after a Mediterranean sun god called Mithras. How did Constantine mobilize both these religions to serve his own ends? Can it be that what appealed to him was a blend of Mithraism and Christianity? Did he fuse the two together to create a super religion 
that would allow him to gain control over the entire Roman world. Not far from the Roman military fort where Simca has seen evidence of Christian soldiers in Constantine's army, another fort was discovered in 1949 by a French bulldog sniffing for bones. But instead of bones or Christian symbols, this fort revealed a special temple built by Roman officers that were devoted to the pagan god, Mithras. My father's dog, same breed as this one, a French bulldog, was sniffing around and found the middle altar. As you can see, it's very wet here. It was all preserved due to the dampness. Now, this is close to the Roman fort? Yes, and it was 500 foot soldiers and Mithras was for the officers. So that's why it's so small. So the Roman officer class, which Constantine belonged to, secretly worshiped Mithras at this temple. At the exact same time, an increasing number of ordinary Roman soldiers were worshiping Jesus right next door. Mithraism was an elitist and secret religion practiced only by men. Initiates walked into this clandestine temple lit only by a few torches. Arriving at the front of the temple, these initiates would have seen an altar to the god Mithras, rays projecting from his head. Lit from behind by candlelight, the halo effect symbolized Mithras' status as a sun god, a striking precursor to the halo that surrounds the head of Jesus. This could be mere coincidence, if it weren't for the fact that archaeologists have found the remains of Mithraic temples all over the Roman Empire. And more often than not, those temples were found hidden beneath the world's first Christian churches. To see one of these Mithraeums, Simca now goes to the Santa Prisca Church in Rome. Here, excavators pulled up the floor of the church and discovered one of the largest Mithraic temples ever found. In cavernous, dark rooms like these, the Roman elite would worship in secret. This is amazing. I feel like I'm in the Notre Dame Cathedral <laughs> of Mithraism. Well, this is a pretty sizable one. The idea is, is this is a recreation of the primal cave where Mithras commits the sacrifice of the bull, which is the core event in Mithraism. The one source of light in this dark temple illuminates the centerpiece a bas-relief that depicts the main myth of Mithraic belief. Jutting out from the primordial rock, the sun god Mithras, the son of the sun, slaughters the sacrificial bull. And through the shedding of his blood, the universe is created anew. Essentially what we're seeing is Mithras being seen as the key creator god who makes possible the regeneration of life and you've got the primordial rock, you know, the cocoon out of which the whole universe is born. Impressive, but it also sounds pretty pagan. And yet, a strange inscription here suggests a more Christian approach. We don't have many inscriptions of Mithras. Right. It's a secret, and they didn't write that much. This is unusual, this place, that it does have a very faded inscription. That know? is correct. One particular text, the Latin translates as, and you have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. You have saved yes. us through the shedding of the eternal blood. Yes. So here, the central bloodletting yes. is seen as an act of salvation. Yes, and the, the key event in the whole nature of cosmic creation and the whole nature of life. Mithras sacrifices the bull and spills its blood, strangely corresponding to the Christian concept of Jesus offering his own blood to save mankind. But the similarities don't end there. A lot of the Mithraic rituals very closely corresponded to what the Christians would do in their worship. The sacred meal that they would participate in is taking the body or the blood of this sacrifice by sharing a meal of bread and wine. Here? Here. So it's communion. It's a basically a communion, a Eucharist. And those who partake in this feast will live forever. 
So just as Christians reenact the Last Supper with Jesus before his death, a form of communion was also practiced here. And just as Jesus died and was resurrected, so was Mithras, which is why at this altar, Mithras is pictured right next to a sculpture of an Egyptian god. And this particular god, if you look carefully at his forehead, you notice that little lock that hangs yeah. down there? That actually would signify that he is the reconfiguration of the god Osiris. And Osiris is the dying exactly. and resurrected right. god of the Egyptians. Right. Just like Christians, Mithraeus believed in the concept of resurrection, which may explain why both religions were popular to members of the Roman military. Faced with the daily risk of death, who wouldn't put their faith in the possibility of resurrection and eternal life? But what's most compelling is evidence that Mithras's followers celebrated his holy birth on December 25th, the same day that Christians would later celebrate the birth of Jesus. It was shocking to me when I learned that nobody talked about Jesus' birthday as December 25th when, right. when Jesus <laughs> was walking the earth. Yes. It was Mithras' birthday. That is correct. And this is because December 25th was, for the Romans, always a traditional important holiday, the Feast of the Saturnalia, which went on for 12 days. <laughs> and everybody was expected to give presents during oh that goodness. time period. And so, so suddenly 12 days, gift giving, December 25th. And a lot of these symbols do find their way into Christian iconography. As it turns out, Mithraism is embedded in the Gospels themselves through the story of the three wise men. At the Church of St. Apollinaire Nuovo in Ravenna, Italy, the iconography is still Mithraic. Here we have the three wise men, also known as the Magi. This is the scene as recounted at the birth of Christ, that these three wise men are bringing these gifts to the Christ child. And the hats that they're wearing, in Greco-Roman art, this sort of became the standard hat that would be used in their artwork to denote somebody who's an Easterner. But these hats weren't worn by just any non-Christian from the East. Called Phrygian caps, they were the official hats of the Mithraic priesthood, also known as the Magi. Even Mithras is depicted wearing the same style of hat. And although there are no Christian symbols on the Arch of Constantine, the arch is literally ringed by eight Magi-looking figures wearing the Phrygian hats of the Mithraic priesthood. But if Constantine was the worshiper of a sun god, how could he have championed Christianity unless he created a new version of Christianity, partially fashioned in the image of Mithras? To do that, he would have had to convince Christians that he was one of them, while in reality supporting the introduction of pagan ideas into their faith. And to do that, I believe Constantine needed the help of someone, someone working on the inside of the early Christian church. Constantine is known to history as the emperor who converted the Roman Empire to the teachings of Jesus. But the Arch of Constantine has no Christian symbolism on it whatsoever. And evidence found beneath the first Christian churches suggests that Constantine fused Mithraism with Christianity to win the patronage of the powerful Roman elite. But this leaves one problem. How could Constantine get true Christians to go along with his version of their faith? And what about the founding fathers of the church? After years of persecution, of worshiping in secret, surely they wouldn't let Constantine manipulate their religion for his gain. Or would they? There's compelling evidence to suggest that Constantine's vision was a postscript to what really happened at the Milvian Bridge. As it turns out, while Constantine was still alive, there was only one church father who recorded Constantine's life and his celebrated conversion to Christianity. His name was Eusebius, and besides becoming Constantine's sole biographer, he also became Constantine's right-hand man in the Christian world. 
According to Eusebius's writings, it's here at the Milvian Bridge, north of Rome, that Constantine had a vision of the cross and a dream about Jesus that inspired him to win the battle and change the world forever. So here's the Milvian Bridge. This is the bridge that gets associated with the battle. So this bridge behind you becomes, in a sense, a metaphor for the change of human history. Yes. The bridge becomes a way to refer to not necessarily the battle itself, but the consequences of the battle. Yet in Eusebius's first draft of this account, he doesn't mention Constantine's vision at all. No vision, no dream yet. So Eusebius's first account of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge that took place somewhere right where we're standing, even Eusebius, who's like yes. a church father, bishop, great yes. admirer of Constantine, does not mention visions. In that account, no. Without a vision of Jesus, how did Constantine convince his contemporaries that he had converted to Christianity? Eusebius' own writings suggest that Constantine persuaded Eusebius to rewrite his account of the Milvian Bridge during a great banquet that Constantine held for the leaders of the Christian Church in the year 325. After years of persecution, Eusebius and his fellow bishops were now being hosted by the emperor himself. And it seems that it was at this banquet, 13 years after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, that Eusebius first heard anything about Constantine's vision. So Constantine tells the story about the vision of the cross before the battle at the Milvian Bridge. When Constantine tells the story, he emphasizes, first of all, the vision of a cross in the sky at noontime. Secondly, he then had a dream in which Jesus Christ himself appeared and explained the vision to him. Almost he, like a, he's a prophet. He has visions, he has dreams. Jesus speaks to him. Precisely. And here, in these original texts by Eusebius, one can see the impact of Constantine's story on Eusebius and his fellow bishops. So here's Eusebius' description of the banquet. He compares this banquet with the emperor to the coming of Jesus. And Christians had anticipated if there was going to be a Christian ruler, it might well be Jesus come back to earth. And now suddenly it turns out to be the emperor himself. Now portrayed as a Christ-like figure, Constantine turned his so-called vision into the official history. And that history was soon propagated by Christian art. Here we have Raphael. Yes. Now Raphael, when he paints, he paints the vision in the sky. It's a cross by this right. sign you will conquer and so on. This is mythology becoming history. Yes. Even without knowing the narrative, you just want to stare at these frescoes. So this is sort of a last attempt to reaffirm this papal narrative, which had already been shown to be a fiction. A myth based not on history, but on a fiction. But if Eusebius' biography of Constantine represents the myth, what did Constantine really believe in? The only direct link we have to Constantine is his arch, which is adorned by pagan symbols. But on it, we can also see reliefs depicting three former emperors. The philosopher Marcus Aurelius, the conqueror Trajan, and the statesman, Hadrian, all stolen from previous monuments and strategically recycled for his arch. Begging the question, why would Constantine decorate a monument to his own achievements with reliefs taken from other emperors, unless he was really saying something about himself? Isn't he telling us what everybody thinks are winners are really losers? And me, I'm, I'm the real winner. At the end of the day, I'm going to refashion the world in a way that Hadrian Trajan and Marcus Aurelius could not even imagine. I would agree with you that Constantine would have been very happy if people looking at his arch had been able to take away the message that he is going to supersede the legacy of even Rome's best previous emperors. But how was he going to do that? 
The answer may lie at the very top of the arch. Here, there is an inscription, and it states in Latin, Instinctu Divinitatis, which describes Constantine as divinely inspired. But if it's not Jesus who's inspiring him, which God is? When looking at what's depicted on his arch, what we find are pagan gods from the Roman pantheon, and none so prominently rendered as the sun god Apollo. The light is amazing. And it's so appropriate with the rising of the sun god right there to have it illuminated by the sun this way. Before Constantine's alleged vision, he followed the official religion of the Roman Empire, the imperial cult, a pagan religion that worshiped Apollo above all else. Much like the pagan god Mithras, Apollo was the sun god that represented the light of creation. According to the imperial cult, Constantine, as emperor, was a superhuman avatar, the link between Apollo and the rest of humanity. And from the archaeology, it's clear that Constantine bought into this idea completely. He commissioned this 12-meter statue of himself. And not surprisingly, the statue came with an enormous head. Built into this statue's healthy hairline may be evidence that Constantine believed he was more than a mere representative of Apollo. There are dowel holes that certainly were for some kind of insert, and it seems likely that it was for a rayed crown. That's not Christian to me. To me, that's saying, I am God. Right. There's absolutely no humility uh, in any of Constantine's self-fashioning. I mean, he's very happy to have a 40-foot-tall statue of himself looming over this space in the center of Rome. He allows cities in the north of Italy to erect cults to his family, to worship him as a god. He is aloof, he's yes. giant, and he's yes. godlike. Yes, he's superhuman. He is superhuman. The image of Constantine with sun rays emanating from his head not only matches the earliest images of Apollo, it also matches the iconography of Mithras. And is it just coincidence that Christian art begins to depict Jesus the same way, with a halo of light around his head? Or was Constantine combining all the gods of light into one? When Constantine claimed to have had a vision of the Melvian Bridge, which religion was Constantine truly embracing? Did Constantine abandon paganism for Christianity? Or did he blend Apollo and Mithras into Jesus Christ and then refashion all three in his own image? As it turns out, when Constantine had his arch built, he topped it off with a bronze portrait of himself. Destroyed in antiquity, this statue depicted him riding the same kind of chariot as Apollo, seemingly taking off into sunny skies. Constantine is known to history as the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, legalize it, and thereby change the world. But the archeology span he left behind suggests an alternative history. His triumphal arch is covered with pagan symbols, and from the statues he erected of himself, it seems that Constantine not only worshipped pagan gods, he saw himself as having a special relationship with them. If Constantine saw himself as divinely ordained, he would have seen his reign as a new founding. He would have believed that he was responsible for changing the course of human history. And the new founding needs a new capital. Rome would no longer do. So he went to what is today Istanbul in modern-day Turkey, and he founded a new capital for his new empire. He didn't name it after Jesus or the apostles. Rather, he stayed true to his nature, and he named it after himself. He called the new city Constantinople. He left Rome, and he certainly never returned there again. Settled on this incomparable site. It bridges the two continents. It's strategically and tactically located in, in virtually an ideal position, easily defended. And I think he wanted a monument to himself. He wanted his own city with his own imprint on it. 
Despite Constantine's reputation as the first Christian emperor, the most dominant feature of Constantinople's skyline was not a Christian church, but a giant column that was once topped by a huge bronze statue of the sun god, Apollo. The statue is long gone, and the column is under renovation. But at the time of Constantine, people were worshiping the sun god here. When the city was built, this was a big plaza or forum, and that column was in the center of it. It's about 100 feet in the air. What's significant about it is that in subsequent years, Christian bishops and theologians were very upset about the fact that the people of Constantinople conducted divine services here. And yet, Constantine's statue of Apollo was not like other pagan images. He did make a slight modification to it. He replaced Apollo's face with his own. But what's even better is the tradition continues that in this statue, he put a relic of the true cross. So he's attaching relics of Jesus to or inserting them in this statue. So he erects a statue of himself. And this statue depicts him as Apollo. But for good measure, we've got a little bit of the true cross mixed in. Yes. Did Constantine pull off the greatest hoax of all time by pretending to be a Christian? Was he actually equating himself with both Apollo and Jesus? Or did he merely see himself as their special emissary? To find out, Simca returns to the arch. But this time, he's not looking at what's on the arch. This time, he's looking at how the arch was positioned. From this bird's eye view, he is reminded that Constantine's arch is off-center by almost two meters from the original road that ran through it. But why? The Romans were famous for their feats of engineering. Surely they wouldn't make a mistake when building the emperor's new arch. There had to be some other reason, a reason that must be hiding in plain sight. Based on ancient records, we know that during Constantine's time, there was a colossal statue that stood 108 meters behind the arch. But this was not just any statue. It was a 30 meter high monument to Apollo. Is there a connection between the statue and the arch? Expert Elizabeth Marlowe thinks she's found that connection. So then I started playing around on the living room floor in my apartment, where I made a little cutout of the arch and I propped it up and I got a doll and I set him up and then set the arch up in front of him and I worked out the proportions very carefully, lying down and peering through the central passageway. For me, that was the aha moment. Based on her living room reconstructions, Marlow came up with a compelling new theory as to why Constantine's arch was built where it was. But to prove her theory, Marlow first had to brave rush hour Roman traffic so that she could gain the right perspective. The evidence on the ground confirmed her hypothesis. Constantine's arch was built off center on the road so as to perfectly frame the Colossus of Apollo behind it. According to Marlowe, as you entered Rome, you would have seen Apollo's head looming above the statue of Constantine on his arch, as if watching over Constantine. But as you moved closer to the arch itself, the sun god would have dropped below Constantine until he was left standing in the center of the main archway. At the point when the statue is framed in the central passageway, it is the figure of Constantine that is now looming above in the sky. As the sun is setting, what is rising is... is Constantine, yes, yes. The arch is literally a reframing of the sun god with Constantine on top of the arch. Marlowe has revealed a clear example where, on the surface, Constantine seems to be putting himself under Apollo, but covertly, he is letting us know that he is greater than Apollo. Can it be that he did the same with Christianity, seemingly worshiping Jesus while replacing Jesus with himself? 
Our investigation has revealed that Constantine merged the great pagan sun gods Mithras and Apollo and replaced their images with his own. Maybe that's not blasphemy by Christian standards, but it does tell us what Constantine thought of himself by depicting himself with rays of light coming out of his head. Constantine was telling the world that he was to be worshipped as a god. Now, where does that leave Christianity? Was Constantine willing to step aside and bow down to the king of the Jews as any Christian would? I don't think so. I think Constantine took Jesus and refashioned him in his own image, thereby turning the anti-Roman rebel we read about in the Gospels into a symbol of Roman imperialism. To find evidence for this, Simca travels to the Archbishop's Chapel in Ravenna, Italy, where there's a sixth century mosaic that depicts Jesus in a whole new light. That's a mosaic of Jesus dressed as a Roman soldier. Although if you look at it more carefully, you can see that he's actually a Roman emperor dressed for command. He's got the military equipment, and of course he has the cross over his shoulder. So when you can kind of see that Christ is also taking on the, the role of being the Roman emperor. He's depicted as the emperor. As the emperor in a military role. So Constantine didn't start running around dressed like Jesus. Right. He got Jesus to dress like him. Right. The irony is that after Constantine, Jesus, who had been crucified by the Roman army, was now depicted as its leader. But what was Constantine's goal? Was he trying to change Jesus? Or was he trying to replace him? To answer this question, Simca now looks into the plans Constantine made for his own funeral. Well, he was actually buried in, uh, in Constantinople in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which no longer exists. It was reported that he was buried with the 12 apostles surrounding him. So Constantine prepares his burial by creating a real coffin for himself. Right. And then these pretend coffins for the other disciples. Right. If you take Jesus' place, one way to interpret it is I, I am Jesus. Well, you could see it that way. On Earth, the Roman emperors do become the stand-in for Jesus because now with the Christian Roman Empire, the emperor takes on the role as being the leader of the worldwide Christian community. But by taking Jesus' place, did Constantine see himself as someone who could promote Jesus' message or subvert it? Can the arch also answer this question? From this high vantage point, Simca suddenly makes a discovery that would have never occurred to him below. How you position something relative to something else, that's sacred geometry. He's essentially putting himself in a relationship with the Flavians. Just on the other side of Constantine's arch is the famous Colosseum built by the Emperor Vespasian Flavius. Across on the left is a triumphal arch built by the same emperor's son, Titus Flavius. And in the center, where there is now a circular depression in the grass, once stood a giant fountain built by Vespasian's other son, Domitian Flavius, one of the greatest persecutors of early Christianity. Why would Constantine want to associate himself so intimately with the Flavian dynasty? As it turns out, the first century Flavian emperors have gone down in history as the men who destroyed Jerusalem and the holy temple in it. They could literally boast that they had torched the house of God. Jesus wept for the destruction of the temple. In contrast, by positioning his arch in close proximity to the destroyers of the temple, Constantine was permanently linking his legacy with theirs. But if that wasn't enough, he celebrated the Flavian name as his own. He called himself Flavius Constantinus. Could it be that just as the Flavians boasted that they had defeated the God of Israel, Constantine schemed to defeat the religion that worshiped Jesus as God's son? 
But as we have seen, Constantine was going to do it, not by oppressing Christianity, but by adopting it. Not by defeating it, but by defining it. He would out Flavian the Flavians. He wouldn't fight people, he would fight their ideas. He would defeat Jesus by transforming him from a crucified Judean rebel into a Roman emperor. For 1,500 years, people accepted the story that Constantine was a true Christian, that he had a vision of the cross, and that he converted a pagan Roman Empire to Christianity. But our investigation has revealed another story, one that isn't particularly Christian. We're not the first. Other investigators have noticed discrepancies in Constantine's character, but they concluded that maybe he wasn't religious. Maybe he was just pragmatic. Christian tradition tells us that the Roman army crucified Jesus in the first century AD, then went on to persecute Christians for the next 300 years. But is it possible that the religion of Jesus was actually spread by the very same people who nailed him to the cross? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Back in the first century AD, the Roman Imperial Army occupied Judea and was known as the most brutal military force the world had ever seen. Made up of 30 legions, each with approximately 6,000 men, the army was paid to put down anyone who defied Roman occupation. According to the Christian Gospels, Jesus of Nazareth did just that. Branded as a heretic by the Jewish authorities and prosecuted as an anti-Roman rebel by the Roman governor, he was publicly executed by crucifixion in the year 30 AD, forcing his followers to worship in secret for fear of persecution at the hands of the Roman army. And yet, just outside the ancient city of Jericho, there is evidence that the same Roman army that oppressed Christians may have been secretly worshiping Jesus. Less than three kilometers from where the Roman army was garrisoned in the year 70 AD, there is a cave that seems to have been used as a church as early as the first century. Simca has come here with the man who discovered the cave, archeologist Yuval Peleg. The Roman military was around here, right? הצבא הרומי מגיע בשנת 68 בקיץ במסגרת הדיכוי של המרד הגדול, הוא מגיע מהצפון, מגיע ליריחו. Right, right over here, right? Like... שני קילומטר, שלושה קילומטר yeah. בערך, ומחכה שם לקראת העלייה לכיוון ירושלים. פלג believes that the cave contains important archaeological information that may date to the time of the Roman occupation. Simka wants to go down and take a closer look but the cave is known to harbor a potentially fatal disease called cave fever, which is carried by ticks that live in the rocks. So before descending into it, both Simka and Yuval have to protect themselves. But you know what? This is a great natural church. <laughs> It's like the Notre Dame Cathedral of the Dead Sea area. As Simca goes deeper, it becomes apparent that this cave was once used as a church. Inside the cave's belly, Yuval Peleg shows Simca the image of a cross carved into stone. Based on its design, it appears to be one of the earliest. You know what that is? That's a fish. The image of the fish is one of the first Christian symbols and was used as a secret handshake amongst early Christian believers. Is it possible that this was a secret church? 
וזה כנראה מקום של נר. אה, כן. פה שמו נר. שניים, אחד, אחד. פה כנראה עוד אחד שלא כל כך הצביע. זה כמו אלתר. אתה יודע, שתי אלתרות. A candle over here in the middle. But who were the people worshipping here? The answer may be provided by the symbol found next to the cross. The Roman sun god, Saul Invictus. The sun is a very important symbol in the Roman army, for example, Apollo, Saul Invictus. Romans worship the sun as the supreme god. But here it is, with a vertical line dividing it into two. Could this solar disk be how the first Roman Christians tried to integrate the Christian idea of the Father and the Son into the Roman belief in the sun? So is it possible that this cave was a secret church for Roman soldiers from the nearby camp? Simca is now shown another symbol that may answer that question, a symbol that looks remarkably like a Roman military standard known as the Aquila. A banner topped by an eagle, its wings spread wide in the shape of an upside-down triangle. I think it's an amazing thing. In a place where you have purposeful crosses, you also have something purposeful that looks like a standard, some kind of flag with a cross in the middle. Like it flows down. It could be even cloth or something. We have a puzzle. We have a sun, crosses, some kind of symbol. Here in this hole in the ground in the middle of the desert, there are symbols that if properly decoded, may tell us how Christianity left the Holy Land and spread across the entire globe. First clue, fish. Which tells us that this is an early Christian place. Second clue, crosses. Which tells us that this isn't a single monk making one cross, this is a congregation. And the fact that it's underground tells us that this congregation is worshiping in secret. Now, since we're in Israel and all of Jesus' earliest followers were Jewish, you'd expect to find Jewish symbols in there. But you don't. Instead, what you find is the Roman sun god. And what looks like a Roman military standard. So is it possible that instead of suppressing Christianity and oppressing Christianity, some early Roman soldiers were actually spreading the faith? Before 2,000 years of history can be overturned based on scratches of a fish and a Roman military standard, Simca will have to find more evidence. So he now heads to Megiddo, called Armageddon in the Christian Bible. It's here, right next to what is now a maximum security prison, that archaeologist Yotam Tefer has found a compelling connection between the Roman army and the world's first Christians. In the second century, the Sixth Affairta Legion came here between Tel Megiddo, where we're standing now, and Megiddo prison, in the big field over there. So the Sixth Affairta Legion was camped right there, the Roman yeah. military. Yeah. They're basically occupying Judea. They control the, the north part of, of the country. It was during Tefer's excavation of the camp that inmates from the prison made their own amazing discovery while digging the foundations of a new cell block. What they found were the ruins of a Jewish village that bordered on the Roman camp that Tefer was excavating outside the prison. And there, right where the village and the camp met on the Roman military side, they found a mosaic containing images of fish. At first, they believed the fish were simply decorations but as excavations continued, they found a definite link to Christianity. The first inscription, uh, it was uh, dedicated to Jesus Christ. Then we found another two inscriptions. 
the last one, talking about the Roman army officer, centurion, that give the money for the floor. So, so this mosaic, there's an inscription dedicating dedic it. Dedicated by a Roman officer. It was confirmed. The mosaic belonged to a house church that was built by a Roman centurion. It was positioned on the border between the Jewish village and the Roman camp. Conclusive evidence that rather than oppressing the first Christians, at least some Roman soldiers were offering them shelter, a place where both Roman soldiers and Jewish villagers could worship Jesus together. But were they practicing Christianity as we know it today? Just like the sun symbol found in the cave near Jericho, the centurion's dedication may hint at a pagan sensibility. The mosaic says, dedicated to the God, Jesus Christ. But the New Testament never refers to Jesus as a God, suggesting that the Romans who worshiped here thought of Jesus as one of many gods, rather than part of the one true God. To their amazement, Right next to the fish, Tefir's team also discovered remnants of a stone table, leading him to believe that the type of worship that was going on here was already highly ritualized. Do you think this table is really a precursor to an altar? Yeah, later on it became the, an altar, yeah. To share a communal meal. But and this is huge, taking communion, eating together, Jews and Gentiles, and you found we, this right at the edge between Romans and Jews. Yeah, Roman and Jews, they live in together. Now, this is like 100 years before Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. This is why it's so important, because if you put everything together, it's evidence of Christian religion in the Roman army. Yeah. But was this Christianization only happening in the Holy Land? Or could it be that just as in Jericho and Megiddo, secret Christians in the Roman army were spreading the faith to Roman forts throughout the empire. To answer this, Simca's investigation leads him to the largest Roman military base in the ancient Near East, the stronghold of Dura Europis. The conventional wisdom is that the world's first Christians were Jews and that they were persecuted by the Roman army. To escape, they fled north to modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. But we've seen evidence that as early as the second century, some Roman soldiers were Christianized. So is it possible that the world's first Christians went north, not because the Roman army was persecuting them, but because they were sheltering them? Not because they were fleeing from the Roman army, but rather because they were following the Roman legions northward. To find the answer, Simca has followed the trail of the Roman army here to the Syrian desert, to a city the Romans occupied in the second century. This stronghold had been buried under desert sands for some 1,600 years. Then, in 1920, a soldier digging a trench accidentally discovered it. When archaeologists began excavating, they soon realized it was the long-lost city of Dura Europis. Because of politics, it's impossible to travel from Israel to Syria. So Simca must ask his friend, archaeologist Dino Politis, to investigate these Roman ruins for signs of Christian worship. Ségolène de Pontbriand has been helping to unearth the city's remains for the past two years. We call Dura the Pompeii of the desert, yeah. which is very incredible to have all this building in the same place. Despite the common belief that Christians weren't worshiping openly in the first centuries for fear of Roman persecution, archeologists here uncovered evidence to the contrary. Not just a house church hidden in a soldier's home, but the world's oldest Christian church. Here in Dura, what's, what's the best evidence that we have Christians? You are going to see the most important, which is the Christian building. This big door is the entrance for the, the main room. I think it's the oldest we have in the world. 
When archaeologists found the church, they also discovered the world's oldest Christian frescoes. However, they have since been sent to Yale University. The frescoes are proof that Christians weren't just getting by at Jury Europus, they were flourishing here. In one of the frescoes, there is an early symbol of Christianity. There is a good shepherd just over here. You can see the sky, also the shepherd here, and is holding a sheep. Early on, the good shepherd became a symbol of Jesus, borrowed from the god Attis, worshipped in the Roman army. This is the first proof for Christian art. It's so, very important. When first discovered, this corner contained a baptismal font, proof that the people who worshipped here were open about their Christianity and were even baptizing new converts. Finding this Christian church isn't enough to prove that Roman soldiers were taking up the faith here, but it does tell us that Christians were being tolerated. There are Christians obviously living and painting beautifully their, their walls yeah. when Christianity is supposed to be illegal, but here there's no problem? Th there is no problem. Does all this demonstrate that Roman soldiers were converting to Christianity? Unlike the cave near Jericho, where we found Roman military symbols next to crosses, this church has no explicit Roman army symbols. So if Roman soldiers weren't worshiping here, where did they worship? Just down the street from the church, excavations have unearthed a temple devoted to the goddess Artemis. We are in the temple of Artemis, dated from the first century AD. So Roman pagan period. Yeah. Artemis was a fertility deity. She was the most popular goddess of the pagan world. Her cult was centered in Ephesus, modern Turkey. Here in Dura Europus, her temple was found right next to the Roman commander's house, known as the Praetorium. You can see um, this is a meeting room with some stairs. You can have a yes. seat. Yes, we can see. I can and see inscriptions too. In Greek. Yes. This is the name of the person who are sitting here. Strangely, none of these inscriptions refer to the goddess Artemis but right above a stone seat that was inscribed with one worshiper's name, archaeologists found a cryptic symbol painted on the wall. The symbol is called the Satyr Square, or Magic Box. Not only does it predate the Christian church down the street, it might just hold a secret Christian message. They have found uh, four Satyr Square, actually. Yeah. This is in this very temple. It was on a plaster. Just like, like that. This is a Roman inscription, and it could be like a code for the Christian. A code. It's a, for sure a soldier inscriptions. Is it possible that Ségolène de Pombriand is right? Could this be a secret Christian code that was used by Roman soldiers? The Satyr Square is made up of five Latin words. Rotus, Opera, Tenet, Arepo, and Seder. But the square is also a palindrome, which means the same words can be read forwards and backwards, top to bottom, always the same. So Rotus read backwards becomes Seder and opera read backwards is a repo. But then, hinged on the letter N, the word tenet remains the same. This appears strikingly similar to the cross found in the cave at Jericho. In the church at Dura, people worshiped Christianity openly, but in the army, where it was illegal, they may have needed the square to communicate their secret faith. Perhaps the square is a code within a code. To find out, we'll need to decipher the square. Dino now travels to the museum in Damascus 
Rumor has it that right after they were discovered, three of the four squares were put into storage here. You are uh, responsible for the classical yes. section of the museum here. Behind the museum's main displays, the curator takes Dino to the back storage rooms, where sure enough, there's Christian artifacts from Jura Europus, which haven't been examined for almost a century. Nobody's seen them. No. So these were wall plaster yes. taken from Dura. Yes. Dino immediately sees an image that looks like a Roman military sign. But instead of containing a vertical line, like the one Simca found at the cave near Jericho, this one contains a full cross. Does this once again illustrate how the first Roman Christians blended Christian imagery with their own pagan beliefs? Something here, something here. Suddenly, Dino sees a striking figure, a pictograph that looks like Jesus, arms spread wide in what scholars call the Orante position, a symbol of piety. Here, there is a sun clearly visible behind Jesus' head, perhaps the oldest depiction of Jesus ever found, an image that would come to dominate Christian art for millennia. And right next to this image is an armored horse, evidence of a Roman military presence. Unfortunately, nowhere in the museum's artifacts can Dino find the satyr squares that he had come here to investigate. We have nothing like this here. No. Do you know the last time these were seen? Have you ever seen this? No. no. At Dura Europa, we've seen evidence of the earliest Christian church, a place where they were baptizing people and gaining converts. But what about evidence of Christians in the Roman army? Well, they did find there four Sator squares. Is it possible that as Roman emperors began to persecute Christians, the newly minted Christians in the Roman army adopted the square as their secret symbol? Is it possible that the army that had crucified Jesus was now spreading Christianity in his name? Simca is searching for evidence that the same Roman army that persecuted Christians was actually spreading its teachings behind the backs of its anti-Christian emperors. So far, his investigation has turned up images that seem to be fusing Christian ideas with Roman sun worship, all found in military camps throughout the Near East. He has also found an ancient symbol called the Sator Square. Does this Latin palindrome contain a hidden code that was used by secret Christians in the Roman army? The answer may be found here in the ancient ruins of Pompeii. Once a center of Roman culture, it was destroyed in the year 79 AD, when Mount Vesuvius erupted, showering Pompeii with fire and ash. Buried for almost 2,000 years under six meters of pumice, Pompeii is the perfect portrait of Roman life, frozen in time, just 49 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. In the ruins, archaeologists uncovered the remains of an ancient training facility for Roman soldiers. What suggests that this is a military place? We have a couple of graffiti on the columns here that do suggest that there were soldiers here. We're in what's been called a palestra or a campus. This could have been like the campus martius in Rome where the military could go and practice. Surprisingly, in the ancient graffiti that was etched into one of these columns, archaeologists discovered the oldest satyr square ever found. The square itself no longer exists, but there's photographic evidence of the exact spot where it was carved. That's the exact spot. It's, it is right here. <laughs> it's as though we're looking at it. To get to the hidden layers of the square, Simca asks Professor Benefil to explain the plain meaning of the words. People have suggested that you could translate it this way. Sator, the sower. Arepo is not a Latin word, so it's been suggested that that's just a name. Tenet holds opera, work. 
Rotas, the wheels. A repo, the sewer, holds the wheels in work. And it's thought that there could be a sense of, you know, you must work hard, reap what you sow, all these different things. It doesn't make a fabulous sentence, but there's not an obvious meaning, and so... What's your gut feel? What's going on with this box? I think that this was a game that anyone could play when you're relaxing or waiting in the shade on a hot summer day, um, and that's maybe why it got written up here. So was the Sator Square nothing more than a game? A meaningless distraction for Roman soldiers with a lot of time on their hands. I'm not convinced. If it was a game, what were the rules? And how much fun could it be playing with a sentence that basically tells you to work hard? I think when it comes to the Sator Square, there's a lot more than meets the eye. But to prove it, I'll need a second opinion. And who better than an expert on ancient games? Simca now travels to the British Museum in London which houses the largest collection of Roman artifacts in the world. It's here that he meets with ancient games expert Irving Finkel. The Romans liked to carve their war games in public places, on pavements and on stone. And sometimes the points of the game, instead of being just with dots or something, were actually laid out with letters which read together made sense. And then you encounter the Sartor Opera, you think to yourself, oh, this is some kind of five by five game. But I'm fairly sure that it's nothing to do with that whatsoever, and it has to be separated and regarded as an altogether different category. L let me see if I understand. You're saying, given what you know about games, this is not a game. I'm certain it's not a game, yes. Because the kind of place that it's found coupled with the amount of labor it costs to carve it on stone, which is not a slight matter, means that it had more significance than that. And since the primary significance is so unclear, I should think the secondary underneath significance is the real one. You think it has meaning? It certainly has meaning, because you don't find lots of Latin inscriptions which are meaningless. Dr. Finkel has confirmed Simca's original suspicions. The Seder Square is definitely not an ancient Roman game. But does it contain a hidden Christian meaning? In an attempt to decipher the square, scholars considered whether the surface meaning of the words were a diversion. So they scrambled the letters to see which Latin phrases they could build. What they came up with ranged from the political, the one in power is at fault, to the demonic, Satan, cruel in all your works. But most were simply absurd. He terrifies the rutabagas, leading most researchers to believe that the square was nothing more than a collection of random words chosen only for their ability to fit the design. To find out how random these five words really are, Simca has called on the help of computer scientist and medical research professor Michael Brudno, who uses mathematical formulas to determine the randomness of human DNA sequences. Simca has asked him to apply the same techniques to see whether the square's letters conceal a secret code. You're looking for things which happen by chance uh, very often and trying to tease apart, is there a hope of this being non-random? Professor Brudno assembles a database of all the five-letter words in the Latin language that can be read both forwards and backwards to see how many five-word squares can be built. The results are astonishing. So from these, we built 50,000 squares. So, 50,000 squares. So 50,000 square. squares, that's a lot of squares. It's right now generating all 50,000 squares. Of the 50,000 word squares that the computer generated, only the Sater Square's debatable message of holds the wheels in work appears to have any metaphorical value whatsoever. So what does this tell you as a kind of a pattern finder? These squares are hard to build. With 21st century technology, it took us a couple of weeks to get to sort through all of them. The person who found these put in some time into this. So it seems unlikely that the Seder Square was just a random invention. It must have had some kind of meaning. What do you say? I think the person came in with an intuition that these are the letters which I want. Because if he chose pretty much any other letters, the person wouldn't have succeeded in building the square. 
So the Setar Square was not a Roman game after all. It seems to have had a hidden meaning built into it from the outset. But did that meaning have anything to do with being a secret Christian in the Roman army? To find that out, I'm gonna have to go to the other end of the empire, to the forts of Hadrian's Wall. If I can find the Sator Square there, then maybe I can prove that this is the cryptic symbol behind the spread of Christianity. Seneca believes that the Roman army that nailed Jesus to the cross also spread Christianity to the ends of the Roman Empire. It happened as a result of the sophisticated network of roads the Roman army built to flex its muscles over the people it ruled. The roads didn't just move soldiers, but also ideas, one of which was Christianity. So far, Simca has found evidence of Christianity among Roman soldiers serving in the Holy Land and nearby Syria. He's even found a mysterious symbol called the Sator Square that may contain a secret Christian message. But is there any evidence that Roman soldiers serving in the area of the Holy Land made it to the farthest reaches of the empire and brought Christianity with them? In Manchester, they found military discharge diplomas belonging to Roman soldiers from the second century AD. What have you got here? These are very helpful because they're a snapshot in time of the garrison of a province. Does the picture tell you of movement? The name of the place where he came from doesn't survive complete. It would suggest he came from Heliopolis in Syria. That's very close to Jesus' country. Yeah. We're talking 133, 132. Jesus was crucified in 33, which means that they could have come into contact with the very earliest Christians. It is quite possible. So soldiers from the Holy Land made it to England. But were they Christians? It seems at least some of them were, because there's evidence that Roman soldiers sent for and married Christian women. This is the tombstone of a lady called Aurelia Aya. She herself came from Salonas, which is in modern-day Croatia, and that is one of the earliest Christian cities in mainland Europe. Um, so that suggests that she may be a Christian, and the idea is then supported by the fact that she lived without blemish. It's an epithet which tends to be used in Christian contexts. So the information pulled together suggests that this is a Christian. The tombstone shows us that not only was she a Christian, but she traveled across the Roman Empire to get married to a Roman soldier. It seems soldiers from the Holy Land traveled to Roman Britain, and some of them were sending for and marrying Christian women. But if the Roman army had a secret population of Christians, is there evidence of that in a military context? Simca now travels north to Hadrian's Wall built in the second century to defend against Celtic tribes from the north. Vindolanda was one of the military forts along the wall. It's here in the soldiers' barracks that archeologists have uncovered the foundations of a Christian church, a Christian tombstone, crosses, and a so far undeciphered symbol carved into a portable altar. This sun cross reminds us of the ones we found at the cave outside Jericho and at Dura Europus. But it has evolved even further. It's now more like an abstract portrait of the crucifixion. Further evidence that Roman soldiers were fusing both pagan and Christian ideas into one and that they were carrying those ideas with them to the farthest outposts of the Roman Empire. The most famous Christian in the Roman army is the first English martyr, St. Alban. St. Alban is said in the accounts to have been martyred by Caesar, who caused this soldier to be arrested for being a Christian, uh, refusing to carry out pagan ceremonies, and has him executed. This story demonstrates why it was important for Christians in the Roman army to keep their faith a secret and share a symbol that no one could decode. I think that the square is likely to be Christian. Christians would be able to use this as a secret uh, way of communicating with each other. 
To find that symbol, Simca now travels back to the city of Manchester. Once a western outpost of the Roman Empire, it's here that archaeologists uncovered the fragment of a satyr square that just might be the oldest Christian artifact ever discovered on British soil. So is this a big surprise? You could say that, yes. <laughs> it's, it's one of those um, wonder moments for an archaeologist when you come across a find like this. You've recreated that around there, eh? We have enough there to enable us to be very confident in reconstruction. This is a very standard piece of Roman pottery called an amphora, and these were big storage jars which were used for olive oil, fish sauce, wine. This kind of clay jug was used to store wine, and the fact that it has the satyr square engraved right on it strongly suggests it had a ceremonial purpose. Maybe it was used during communion. And the interesting thing with this find, it came from a rubbish pit between two buildings. Simkin now finds out that the rubbish pit was located next to a Roman military fort. There would have been auxiliary soldiers bringing their religions with them, one of which would have been Christianity. So why not for a soldier to put this piece of graffiti on the emperor for a subverted religion that he totally believed in? So you just look at it, it's yep. some letters, but it could preserve somebody taking, risking their lives for their faith. I think it's remarkable that he's got such a small fragment, but there's such a big story. In the centuries that followed, squares just like this one found their way to Roman forts in Portugal, France, and Hungary. Wherever the Seder Square went, Christianity soon followed. But can the secret message of the Seder Square finally be decoded? Simca has found the Seder Square in a Roman military context at the farthest outposts of the Roman Empire in both Britain and Syria. He's convinced the square holds the missing clue of how Christianity spread to the Western world. But he still doesn't know what the square really means. To break the code, he's going back to where the earliest Seder Square was found, here in Pompeii. Back before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii was the Roman version of Sodom and Gomorrah. The streets were lined with brothels like this one. The walls covered with body frescoes depicting sexual pleasures that anyone could experience for a price. But not everyone in Pompeii was drunk on sex and paganism. Some people believed that Pompeii was going to be punished in the manner of the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah. Total annihilation. This piece of ancient graffiti invokes a curse against Pompeii, revealing a distinctly Christian point of view. What do we make of it? You always want to start with what's the clearest, and this is a kerem, C-H-E-R-E-M, is a transliteration of a Hebrew word. And it's often in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So it's always used for divine retributions, just blotting out. And then poinium, it's written in Latin, it's an attempt to represent a Greek word, poine, a blow or a strike. Ponium cherem it means to strike with utter destruction. Exactly. And these are the five-pointed stars, Solomonic, as if to bring power to a kind of a curse, maybe. The harem curse was found in the doorway to this house. It seems to have acted as an amulet, warding off immoral activity. But who were the people who lived here? Inside, archaeologists found a fresco that depicts the owners, a man named Paco Procolo and his wife. From the fresco, we learn that Paco wasn't Italian. He probably came from the Middle East. In his hands, he holds Roman citizenship, given to soldiers after 25 years of service. But is there any evidence that Paco Procolo was a Christian? From the Pompeian record, we learn that at one point, he purchased a bakery. He then discovered that his building was adorned with pagan sexual imagery, which Paco felt compelled to cover up, evidenced by the remains of white plaster. Then inside, above the bakery's main furnace, 
archaeologists uncovered a cross. Strong evidence that this former Roman soldier was now practicing Christianity openly. Simca now wants to see if any other artifacts were found at Patwo's house. Suddenly, he is presented with an inscription whose existence he was not aware of. Not a photo, not a fragment. It is the world's oldest surviving Sater Square. This is not the same house. Ah, the same house, he said. But they're saying that this Sator Square was found in the same house as the Cherem inscription. This square is dated no later than 79 AD, just 49 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. And right above the square, we also find the image of the fish, inscribed in the same style as the one found at the cave near Jericho. I think we found where the magic box came from. Clearly, the square was no game. Here it was found in a doorway alongside biblical symbols and curses. We even know the name of the former soldier who inscribed it, Paco Procolo. But we still don't know what it means. So Simca pays one final visit to Dr. Irving Finkel. The likelihood is that it's an early Christian device in which they wanted to write the words Pater Noster in such a way that it wasn't obvious that that's what it was. And you think it has Christian meaning? Anybody who takes the effort to write an inscription has a meaning behind it. And meaning is sometimes transparent and sometimes obscure and sometimes both at once. Dr. Finkel believes that the square refers to the phrase Pater Noster. As it turns out, when you reorder the square's 25 letters in the shape of a cross, using the square's only N as your axis, you can create the Latin phrase Pater Noster, which is translated as Our Father, the first two words of the most important Christian prayer in the Gospels. Arranging the words in this way leaves four letters outstanding, two O's and two A's which seems to represent Jesus' famous lines from the book of Revelations. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But there may be one other Christian message encoded in the square. It involves a repo, which is the only word that has no meaning in Latin. What if it is a mix of Greek and Hebrew? just like the curse found in Paco's doorway. In Greek, there is one word that sounds a lot like Aleppo. That word is Aleppo, which sounds like a Greek version of the Hebrew A, once again forming the Alpha and Omega. Using the word Aleppo would have ruined the palindrome, so the similar sounding Aleppo was used instead. If this is right, the Sater Square's five words read, the Alpha and Omega hold the wheels in work. In other words, decoded, the secret message that Roman soldiers were spreading is, Jesus makes God's work possible. Found with Roman and early Christian symbols, the Sater Square hides an image of the cross a secret prayer, and a concealed message, all pointing towards a Christian meaning. Found at Roman military camps across the empire, it also tells us that at a time when Christianity was an illegal movement, Roman soldiers weren't just adopting Christianity, they were adapting its symbols for their own needs, thereby shaping Christian ideas and icons for future generations of worshipers. Common perception has been that the Roman army persecuted Christians for the first 300 years after the crucifixion, and that Christianity was being spread by apostles and martyrs. But compelling new evidence suggests that this is not the whole story. Finding the Sator Square all over the Roman military world tells us at least three things. First, that Roman soldiers were risking their lives by worshiping in secret. 
second, that their idea of a sun god was influencing their idea of Jesus. Third, that the religion of love was being spread not only by people fleeing the Roman army, but by people serving it.